their uh like post like after they graduated they go back and they uh what is it like a reunion like a yep. some sort of thing mm -hmm. for the for stanford and we're driving around the convention center and we go aha that must be it because there's all these people with sashes on uh -huh. and Why? it was a crossing guard <laughs> convention like that sounds like a joke that i made up but it was literally we thought the stanford gathering we pulled in because we saw all these people with these red sashes and it Why would they out. have red sashes? Because that's the color of the school. And, but right. yeah, like it was like, I don't know, is the marching band here or something? Like we just like huh. went over there. It's like, oh no, this is crossing guard. Connection. Crossing guard. We're in the wrong part. Crossing guard. And 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 everybody who was who was actually in attendance uh was uh had been to the law school and was looking for clients. <laughs> that was all that showed up. It was really <laughs> people who apparently were just looking to see if they could represent. Have you been in any alum. accidents lately? <laughs> <laughs> are you happily married? Okay, moving on. What? You, yeah. Who are you? What do you do? And how can I use that to my advantage in some yeah. way? Um, I didn't go to high school. So library. Library. Oh yeah. You know. Welcome to the show, everybody. We are here, and it's yeah, just in story time. Pre-show story time. We're just talking about Ivy League schools, you know, as you do, as one does, speaking. Yeah, pictures live, sound is awesome. Thanks, Fada. Yeah, we do not have an echo mm -hmm. today. It's, it's got to be a fourth party problem. I think it's a fourth party problem. Uh, the last two, the last, all of the interviews, it's been an echo. So where are they? What did they have open? Yeah. That is echoing. I wonder if they're using echoing. a different browser or... I don't know. All right. Oh. Well, we, we're not echoing today, which is awesome. 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 Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, God, there was a little echo. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do today. All right, everyone. Are you ready to do a show? Yeah. Are we ready to make this party rumble? How come my browser can remember everything except that I'm not a robot? You are not a robot. Because you aren't today, so but you might be tomorrow. Oh, I guess that's the whole point of that box. It yes. can't be autofilled. And hmm. unbreakable pain. Huh? Hmm. Did you say unbreakable pants? I did i gotta put that that goes oh go. no i can't wait for this it's gonna <laughs> be a good one <laughs> i know I'm like hmm. welcome everyone to this week in science the sister and brotherhood of the unbreakable pants starting the show in three two this is TWIS. This Week in Science, episode number 672, recorded on Wednesday, May 23rd, 2018. Turtles love science! Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your head with an Iceman, octopus aliens, and unbreakable pants. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Imagine for a moment, if you will, contact with an alien species, a voyaging spacecraft colony of creatures who would like to live peacefully here on Earth with us. They had to leave their own planet behind because it became too inhospitable. What with the pollution, pervasive hazardous chemicals, unstable atmospheric climate changes, and an ecosystem in complete freefall. They just had to head for the stars, and their ship was nearly out of plutonium when they happened by Earth. And so, with open arms and a bit of uncertainty about whether we really have a choice, we let the aliens live amongst us. Soon, we discover that the new arrivals have a voracious appetite and an affinity for resources that rivals even our own. After only a week, they improve oil extraction to the point where there is no more oil to drill for. Two weeks in, and there seems to be a distinct lack of trees where once there were many. Three weeks in, and somehow they managed to catch and eat nearly all the fish in the sea. By week four, 
There isn't a four-legged creature over four pounds that hasn't disappeared down their bellies. And at the end of just a month, the air is unfit to breathe, the oceans are acidified, and the ecosystem is in complete freefall. And as the aliens depart in search of more fertile planets to plunder, the humans take a moment to ponder. This must be what we look like to those weirdos that listen to This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I want to learn everything I want to fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? This week in science What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? This week in science Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you, too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another show. It's This Week in Science coming at you, bringing you all the science, throwing the science at you, science all the way down. I mean, turtles all the way down. I mean, it's World Turtle Day today. Oh, no, Yay! No. So on the day that we're recording this is a day of celebration for our Tertillian friends. <laughs> Testudines. Testudines. What's your favorite turtle, Blair? <gasps> Great question. My favorite turtle would have to be the leopard tortoise, which remember, all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises. Hashtag Blair's Animal Corner. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the leopard tortoise is from Africa, and when it floods, they can float. Oh, floaty tortoise turtles. And they're pretty heavy. They're like 40 pounds. That's a good skill to have for flooding areas in years when there's, or seasons when there's lots of rain, monsoon seasons that they bring. Yes. Yeah. Um, here's a fun fact about me, actually, for World Turtle Day. My first mm -hmm. word was turtle. I don't know what my first word was. That's it's a good thing to go back to the uh, the databanks for. Yes, yes. But this says a lot about you, I think. Yes. Although technically it was turdo. <laughs> turdo, I like the turdo. <laughs> Everybody, mom and daddy, it's a turdo. turdo. But you know what this is? This is This Week in Science, and we've got a great show coming up. I have all sorts of science news. Ahead, I have stories about interstellar aliens, the Iceman's brain, and worms. Justin, what do you have for us? I've got the answer to every problem, an updated history of mammals, and <clears throat> the end of the world may be closer than you think. No, that yeah, no. Totally yeah. Okay, we're going to have a positive spin on that one. Blair, what's in the animal corner? Oh my gosh, this week I went hunting for mythical creatures. I have three different stories about creatures that are so crazy, they may or may not even exist. May or may not. Maybe they're aliens. Maybe they're from here. Maybe you can find them. Maybe they can't. Maybe it's about a Sasquatch. Maybe it's about the Loch Ness Monster. We'll find out. Wow. <laughs> News at 10. No, I mean, hopefully a lot earlier than that. Yes. <laughs> hopefully Blair's Animal Corner will be on before 10 p.m. Pacific time this evening. Let's hope. <laughs> Let's hope. Let's hope we don't run on and on and on as we are wont to do. All right. So let's make this show happen. And... As we get into it, I would like to remind everybody that if you have not subscribed yet to This Week in Science, you can do so just by going to twist.org and clicking the subscribe button. It'll send you to either YouTube, Google, or um, iTunes. That's the other one. <laughs> That's the other one where you will be able to subscribe to our video channel or our RSS feeds. We're also on all sorts of players out there and on Facebook. All good places you look for these things. You know what you look for? This Week in Science. Don't forget twist.org. And that is where you can find information on subscribing to us. 
All right, let's dive on in, everybody. So the news this week, the space internet has been abuzz with the news of an interstellar alien. Ooh. But I, when I say alien, I don't really mean like a living alien like E.T. I mean a bunch of space rock. A bunch of space rock. This space rock was discovered in 2015, and its name is 2015 BZ509. Taking a look at this object that is in the distant solar system, uh, it orbits the sun at about the same distance as Jupiter, and it's about three kilometers in diameter. Uh, taking a look at it, everyone thought, oh, this looks pretty normal. And then they went, wait a minute. No, it doesn't. This isn't normal at all. It's orbiting the sun retrograde. So everything follows the same kind of orbit. It's called prograde. Everything's orbiting in the same direction around the sun. All the normal solar system objects that we know and love all go prograde around the sun. But not this little guy, not BZ. BZ is going retrograde. It's going in an, a direction opposite to everything else. And so, and it's it's really not in the same plane of the ecliptic either. It's really tipped. So it's at an angle and it's orbiting the wrong direction. One of these things is doing its own thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So researchers published a paper this last week uh, suggesting, in the title, no less, that this is an interstellar object that was floating through space, got ejected from some other galaxy or solar system, and got scooped up by the sun's gravity and the gravity gravitational pull of all the other of the planets in our solar system and became a member of our solar system after our solar system got its start, but that it didn't start out here. Only because, basically because, they ran a bunch of simulations on a computer, and they all the ways they simulated it, they're like, ah, it probably came from somewhere else. There's nothing really that explains it going the other direction. However, that's not entirely true. And many people on the interwebs do think that these researchers are jumping to conclusions with their conclusion <laughs> that this rock is from another part of our of our universe, right? So or galaxy, there's, even right? Or galaxy. So, there's no there's no evidence other than its retrogradeness and inclination that that would suggest this. And it is possible because of the micro perturbations that occur from large uh, gravitational bodies like Jupiter and Saturn that, you know, just bump it back into place that maybe it, it is from our solar system. Maybe it got its start here four and a half billion years ago and just ended up in a stable, a stable orbit. Yeah. He's like, I've been here the whole time, guys. I don't know what the problem is. What were you going to say, Justin? Well, I mean, it, it, it's it's not that big uh, is is one thing. So, you know, three kilometers, if you're not familiar with the metric system, is about 3,000 meters, right? Right, which it's is, tiny. Which is, which is big, but it's not like, you know, solar system big. Right. Uh, it, it would, it seems, there's a couple things that seem odd. Like, I don't know how many of the of these retrograde orbiting objects there are that we've discovered if this is like the only one that we've identified pretty much that's really <laughs> weird it's weird and it means that you know like ah something bumping into something getting caught in an orbit you should see more of it so i'm wondering if we just haven't this is like one of the first ones we've identified There's more out there but maybe they're harder to see because they're going the other way like i don't know um, but I, I, I agree. I think it's kind of a leap to say it has to be from a like, you know, outside of the solar system to have been able to follow into this uh, orbit. I just I think it's probably the first one we've seen. So there's going to be a lot of explanations yeah. for it. And then we'll find more mm -hmm. and go, oh, this is a common thing. It's just hard to see because it's small and it's going the opposite way of everything. So it doesn't it's not being tracked like a telescope would normally try to. Get a glimmer and track an object with, you know, the motion of everything. Going the other way, it's, you look for it and you can't find it again. 
Oh, <laughs> Wait, where did it go? We were not looking <laughs> in the right place because it's not going the right direction. Right. If yeah. it's so weird, yeah. right? Right. If it's such a weird thing for us to track something in that direction, that's probably why we don't see a lot of it. Yeah. So, I mean, that is if, if it was captured by our solar system, you know, yeah, maybe there it really is one of very few objects that our solar system is captured and that's why it's so weird that's possible it's also possible that it just got a weird start and there are going to be more of them and yeah we just haven't seen them yet so um all those headlines out there saying enters first interstellar planetary body that's here blah, blah, blah. it's could be jumping the gun just slightly but didn't we already have that with, with the with the uh Ooh, um, 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 yeah, um. the thing I can't pronounce. <laughs> that also supposed to be from outside. So that's the that's the cigar shaped spaceship, right? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> well, it's yeah. not a that's not a yeah. spaceship. It's just yeah. an, a, just a an asteroidy type thing floating through. Yeah. Um, so the difference is that this object BZ is in a stable orbit, and so is a part of our solar system. It's just wonky. Wah, mwah, wah, mwah. I can't. <laughs> <No>. Cigar <laughs> shaped. Sorry. The something. cigar shaped asteroid that was really literally passing through. Right. It's not in a soul, it's not in a stable orbit. It was just doing a drive by right. based on everything that they could see about it. It that they do not think it's going to loop around at any point and come back. Or maybe but it who's was just to say maybe it was just sitting still and we were passing through it. Like. Yeah, there's that. But I was gonna say in a similar trippy vein, <laughs> who's to say what in our solar system is original and what is new in the cosmic timeline? Right. And so, okay, cosmic timeline, well, there is the whole, you know, what dust was in the protoplanetary cloud at the beginning of the solar system. Do we count all those objects that were the dust that was there first that coalesced in those objects? Right. There you go. You know, how far back do you go? Um, but the re reality is, is that, yeah, there's a bit of, I mean, looking at it and looking at its orbit and trying to figure out how that fits into our ideas of solar system formation. Um, but at the same time, until we really get a close look at it or, and can measure its uh, chemical composition to start looking at isotopes to be able to determine whether or not it has the same molecular chemical makeup as the rest of the stuff in the solar system, um, that's until we have that evidence we can't jump to the conclusion that it's from somewhere else. And, and even situation. then, we'd have to assume that somewhere else was vastly different. Like, yeah. Like, like, That's true. Uh, yeah. It's all difficult. Vastly, vastly different. All right. So on that note of vast difference, I want to jump into a little dose of sunshine. Mm. I'm going to be a little Miss Sunshine here. In a recent study, researchers um, in... Uh, where was this? This was in China, this research that was done. A researcher Wei Zhong of the University of Science and Technology of China. This is actually an accidental discovery, and he did, <gasps> did not set out to look at a little bit of sunshine. It's a post-it situation. <laughs> it is, but he did. Um, so he found that UV light when it, uh, he found UV light led to increased concentrations of a compound in neurons that uh, shouldn't have been there, that they wouldn't think would be there, and they didn't know why it was there, because this compound is normally discovered in the skin. And this compound's called urocanic acid. And urocanic acid is in, involved in the skin's metabolic response to UV light and that inflammatory protective response that the skin, uh, that the skin undergoes when UV light uh, affects it. Now, UV light we know is good for us in some ways because it leads to uh, the production of vitamin D, but it also is bad for us because it can lead to mutations that are cancer causing. However, this discovery of this urocanic acid in neurons led him to go, what? What's going on there? And instead of just saying what, like a good scientist, 
he did experiments to figure out what was going on. And so, of course, he had to shave some mice. <laughs> Of course, as, as you as, as you, you do, you got the next logical actually, step. Of course, can't you he just order them? <laughs> you could. I don't. Uh, so he exposed these shaved mice. He had two groups. One, he exposed them to low dose of UV light, which is responsible for sunburn in humans for two hours. Um, and he had a control group that uh, was not exposed to the UV light. And then he performed uh, mass spectrometry to uh, look at the brain cells and see what kind of chemicals were popping up, molecular uh, signatures were popping up from the brain cells of these mice. And he found urocanic acid increased in the neurons of the animals that were exposed to the UV light and not in the animals that didn't get the light. So then he went on to say, okay, what else is going on? Discovered that uracanic acid is involved in the nerve in nerve cells in the glutamate pathway. Glutamate is an excitatory neuro neurotransmitter that is involved in mood and memory and is in charge of a whole bunch of very important functions within the brain. And so uh, in the end, what his all of his experiments did was link UV light exposure to the production of this urocanic acid and increased concentrations of glutamate in the brain, which led to improved memory and learning in animals exposed to UV light compared to those that did not get any UV light. Mm. And it worked when they just injected urocanic acid into the brain cells as opposed to exposing them to the UV oh. light. And so what I'm thinking, there's been a question for, there are questions as to, you know, where does seasonal affective disorder come from? Why, um, you know, why is it that sunny weather can affect people's mood in a positive way? And maybe this, I mean, this study's in mice. So, you know, and it's only one study, of course, but uh, perhaps this is one of the links in the chain that uh, indicate how, or it will explain how sunlight through, you know, affecting our skin can actually lead to a positive mood effect in the brain. So since you mentioned that he basically sunburned these mice. <laughs> he sunburned the mice. Would you have the same positive <laughs> effect if you slathered these naked mice with sunscreen? No, I don't think so because it, this uracanic acid is a result of this, the UV radiation's interaction with the skin cells. And Yikes. so if you have sunblock on or sunscreen, you're blocking that interaction. Wow. And so it would reduce that. So, um, you know, I this is not an endorsement for people to stop wearing sunscreen. Right, right, but, right, right, right. you know, that's right. what I'm saying. This is right. only a study in mice. This is not in right. people. We don't even know if this same process works in people. But this right. is a very interesting, uh, interesting finding. And perhaps mm -hmm. this is something uh, that should be looked into much, much more carefully in humans. Mm -hmm. So don't go to stick your head in a biosafety cabinet and click on the UV lights. Nope. Just no, yet. don't do that. Yeah, and you have no, to be what? careful of what kind of UV it is, Justin, because not all UV lights the same. So what? Yeah. one of the things I think is really kind of interesting about this system uh, is that, yeah, mice don't have a whole lot of exposed skin normally. Yeah, and they're nocturnal. Yeah. Like so the question uh, is, why would this be a mechanism that would uh, still be uh, prevalent? In mice. I mean, is it possibly that if a mouse is found <laughs> out in the daylight, they, you know, they want to have their behavior and their memory fine tuned so that they can escape because they mm -hmm. are in the wrong place at the wrong time? Um, it's probably you know, that's, preserved. That's looking for an exp explanation. Right. It's but. probably a preserved thing that they're not yeah. using. That's an yeah. ancestral link. But how far? I mean, I picture mice as direct lineage from the first mammalian. So, True, which probably isn't like the thing, but. Like, like so so this would be possibly something that's a pre-mammal 
characters. So that's what I was going to say is reptiles, for example, have to have specific UV light depending on the species or they will get really sick. They could even die. So Mm -hmm. this is a mistake that people make when they get their first pet reptile. They don't need know that they need UVA or UVB or both bulbs. And then they have terrible things happen to their pet because their pet gets really, really sick. Mm -hmm. So if UV light is part of a healthy reptile, yeah, there's a potential that there's a common link there. Yeah. But it's also, you have to remember the correlative, correlatively mm-hmm. that we are on a planet that is bombarded with UV light every day. So that is also a, a very high potential to get some convergent traits related to UV light. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's an in, it's interesting. In, nonetheless, I mean, finding... Uh, uh, pathways like this where, you know, something affecting the skin ends up making its way into neurons that get into the brain. I mean, that whole, how, did, how is that all happening in, in the first place? You know what I just realized too is sundowning in seniors. That's directly relate, related to um, it getting dark and their memory. Yeah. And but I don't know if it's, yeah, I don't know if that's getting darker, just being it's the end of a day and yeah, energetic stores in the brain are affected. I don't know. It's, um, it's a thought. It's a Old thought. people and lizards, same thing. According to <laughs> We're all <laughs> just lizards, Justin. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thoughts for sunny days as the sunny days are, uh, are on their way and still to come for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> Some people, though, just like taking their brains and sticking them into MRI machines for the name of science. Like the Iceman. Huh? Well, yeah, you say, huh? Which one is this? There's no his, other- name, his name is actually Wim Hof. Wim Hof, the Iceman. Uh, is, that a, is, is that a supervillain? No, Which he's kind of a, he's kind of a superhero who's oh, okay. real. Wim okay. Hof is the guy who you may have heard of, like in Extreme People or Feats of Amazingness by People. Oh, the Stan Lee uh, superhuman thing. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, but he's this guy is able to control his body's ability. To feel pain. And so he is able through breathing exercises, which he has, I think, patented and written mm-hmm. about the Wim Hof method. Um, he is able to control his body's responses to temperature, to hot and to cold. He has um, run a marathon in the Namib desert, not drinking any water the entire time. Uh, he's also, uh, he's also climbed Mount Everest and Mount Kilimanjaro in shorts. So he goes outside in bare feet uh, into the snow. He doesn't get frostbite. He has, he feels no pain and researchers have wondered how he does it. And Mm -hmm. so in a recent study, a pediatrician at Wayne State University School of Medicine and his co-authors put Wim Hof into a magnetic resonance imaging machine to see what happened to his body when they exposed him to cold water or hot water. And they put him in this like skin tight suit that had water tubes, had tubes with water in them so they could have him inside the MRI machine and pipe the cold water through the suit and see how his body responded to it. So they had him go through his breathing exercises and they uh, and then exposed him to the cold. And what they found is that basically this guy has found a way through breathing, almost like meditation, he has found a way to hack into his body's stress response. And in in his initial breathing exercises, it's kind of, uh, it's like hyperventilation where he blows off a lot of oxygen and increases the amount of carbon dioxide in his body. And so his body has a hypercapnic response is what it's called. And the physiological response is to the situation of hypercapnia, a buildup of carbon dioxide within the blood, in, within the blood. And as a result, the body has a stress response to try and increase oxygen. And so it increases blood perfusion to the tissues. It, it, uh, there are 
there are other areas like the extremities that maybe have um, have the blood pulled back from them. Hmm. But in, in this MRI, they determined that he, when he's exposed to cold specifically, he's able to activate the part of the brain that's responsible for releasing opioids and cannabinoids into the body. And so he is basically triggering his brain's pain control system and re releasing endogenous, that means made by the body, opioids and cannabinoids. So pain medications created by the body, released that end up also releasing dopamine and serotonin so that he feels good at the same time. And, um, and so he has a euphoric effect at the same time as not feeling any pain. And that effect, he says, uh, Wim Hof himself says, lasts a few minutes. But his trick is, in effect, tricking his brain into continuing the stress response by keeping in mind the fact that the pain or the stress on the body is going to continue. And so they still don't know exactly how he does all the feats of physiolo physiology that he is able to do. But one of the things is he is actively triggering in a feed-forward sense certain areas of his brain responsible for uh, managing pain. So he's literally high on life. <sighs> yes. Yes. So he's got like a runner's high, but oh he doesn't gosh. have to run to get it. Wow. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm gonna stay home. I think. Huh? I don't. I don't need to hike Mount Everest in shorts. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> no, not many people do. But what the researchers are interested in is the ability of this guy to come up with these pain responses, and um, if he's able to also, uh, in a in a sense, control his autonomous system. Maybe other people who need, uh, you know, who have disorders, mm -hmm. who have eczema, who have. Um, immune system problems, maybe they can learn, or maybe who have chronic pain even, that maybe people can learn to harness the method that he's come up with in a similar way to manage their uh, their disorders without having to rely on pain medications to be able to do it. So learning from a yeah. person who is an extreme, yeah. we'll see. Wow. He's fascinating. Why doesn't he freeze? Why doesn't he get frostbite? That's what I want to know. Yeah, crazy. he's got to be cutting. He's got to be changing his blood flow he, like a penguin, I would assume, where yeah. he's restricting blood flow to his feet, his extremities, and um, creating a feedback loop of hot and cold above it. Yeah. That would be um, my assumption, but he doesn't have the, yeah. the kind of the... Um, scaffolding for that in his body. So I'm not sure no, how that would human happen. bodies are, we have a little bit of it, but we don't really yeah, have the same true. kind of system to the shunting, to shunt the cold blood over to the warm side to be able to, to warm it up in a, and in, in a way that a, some birds and other, uh, other animals do. We don't have the same system. And so oh, yeah. maybe he does. We, we do a bit. A little bit. That. No, I mean, no, we, we have a we little, but it's not to the extent. It's yeah. not to the, the, this, I mean, in some animals, it is a literal, like there are capillaries that go back and forth between you have, you have the vein and the artery, right? The vein and the artery. And there are capillaries that connect the two where in humans there aren't, but we do have a little bit of it. There is shunting. There is definitely some aspect of that. I mean, I have Raynaud's, uh, I have a, a disorder called Raynaud's and when I get cold, my fingers, like there's some nervous response that takes all the blood out of my fingers. My fingers turn yellow. Because yeah. <laughs> you have genes from a people who lived in a frigid northern environment uh, where it's like the ice age all the time. Right, and, exactly. <laughs> and that's and that's liking peoples. Yeah. And that's that's when you'll see that in uh, in Inuits to an extent, too. Uh, although morphology is also a little bit different there too, but the, the, the body preserves the life force of heat into the core mm. by pulling it away from the extremities. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Heat it up. We will survive. Justin, what'd you bring? Hey everyone. This is this week in science.
Uh, yeah, I have a solution for every problem. Uh, global warming, space elevator, smart grid, lead into gold, unbreakable pants. What do you mean? Solve. It's 42, right? <laughs> 42. That's one invention. It only requires one invention. And uh, somebody beat me to it, actually. Uh, it's what the Vanderbilt University researchers came up with. It has to do with carbon nanotubes. This super material, stronger than steel, more conductive than copper. Uh, the reason they're not in every application from batteries to tires to unbreakable pants as it is, is that the, the, the really amazing properties of nanotubes only show up in, a, in the teeny tiniest version of it, which are extremely difficult to make and expensive. This is much, much more expensive than, than, than gold, right? Like any of these precious diamonds, forget it. It's easier to find. Uh, not only did the Vanderbilt team show that they can make these materials cheaply, they made them from carbon dioxide pulled out of thin air. These materials, which assistant professor of mechanical engineering Kerry Pint calls black gold and thereby earning him a crusty old gold prospectory voice in an upcoming quotey thing, uh, could steer the conversation from negative impact of emissions to how we can use the carbon dioxide pollution to propel us into a future technology. One of the most exciting things about what we've done is use electrochemistry to pull apart carbon dioxide into elemental constituents of carbon and oxygen and stitch together with horn swathered in precision those carbon atoms into pay dirt or uh, new forms of matter, Pint says. Uh, that opens the door to being able to generate really valuable products with carbon nanotubes. These could revolutionize the daggum world. And I reckon they will, too, says Pint, uh, approximately. And a report published uh, today in Chemical, uh, I, this might not be today, Chemical, the American Chemical Society, Pint, and his inter interdisciplinary team of uh, folks and PhD student Anna Douglas and the team describe how Tiny nanoparticles 10,000 times smaller than human hair can be produced from coatings on stainless steel surfaces. He was making them small enough to be valuable. So they've got this system that puts the current through there and it can, it sort of pulls the carbons and attracts them and they build up. The problem is they keep building up. And as soon as you're bigger than these nano 10,000 times smaller than human hair, they're not the super valuable, useful future technology building nano. Uh, substances anymore so they came up with and patented a technique to keep the particles small and uh, they started a company uh, with this too which was uh, funded by the department of energy uh, has a has a program that helps these startup companies with good ideas the company is called sky nano and is focused on building upon the science of the process to scale up and commercialize products from the materials what we've learned is the mother load of science and opens the door to now build some of the most valuable materials in our world, such as diamonds and single walled carbon nanotubes from carbon dioxide that we capture through the air. That's such a cool double thing. So unbreakable pants is a possibility. Uh, from this technology. <laughs> Why is that where your brain goes? I want my carbon nanotubes to make unbreakable pants. Are you I'm breaking like, pants? You buy Justin? one pair of pants uh, that you like and are comfortable and you never have to buy more. Do we need uh, what, to talk about your to usage of pants? I don't understand, I don't understand what, why that isn't a valuable thing that we could be contributing <laughs> to society. Um, but yeah, like this is, and, and if we combine this too with the story last week, or so when uh, a team figured out how to position the nanomaterials to to construct larger objects with uh, to organize them. Yeah, this uh, this whole field seems to be coming together very rapidly. Uh, and this was this was the thing that they keep saying or kept saying we kept talking about, which we don't anymore. Space elevator. No more launching mm -hmm. stuff. Up. If you have something strong enough. And stable enough, you can just 
put things on the space elevator to put them into orbit or to launch uh launch craft from so question are they flexible or are they super rigid both depending okay. on how you organize them so could you mm -hmm. load a 3d printer with this stuff uh, probably yeah there you go there that'd you be go. cool yeah fuzzy printing yeah 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 i think you probably could it's nanoscale nice nano and nice that's for sure that is for sure all right everybody in the world i hope you're ready for your unbreakable pants and your space elevators you're gonna wear those unbreakable pants and your ride up the space elevator to our our what i guess our one, low one earth place, orbit our low earth orbit one base. place you want unbreakable pants in space yep that's right i do i yep yep absolutely you know what time it is though right now you know what we have space time for? is it you know what we have space for oh, no. what blair's animal corner oh, we should have one of those. she loves our creature great and small by pet, still a pet, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And I'm going for her. Got Blair. I am so excited. I have a Blair's Animal Corner that is quite unusual this week. I am not spending a lot of time talking about things that we discovered. I'm going to spend time talking about things that are not true. Oh. <laughs> so, first, I want to talk about the story that was all over the internet this week. Octopuses are from space. No, they're not. Uh, yes, no, they're they not. Are. no, they're not. Yes, they I mean, are. people people want them to be. Everybody's like, yeah. ooh, mm -hmm. octopuses are so weird with their tentacles and stuff mm -hmm. so they're octopuses are very space. interesting like they're not from an ocean though like we're all in space it's just so <laughs> the the yeah. hypothesis is that octopuses are aliens that they came here as a fertilized egg on an asteroid landed on this planet seeded the earth so this was the headline first let me say so that was the headline that was all what over the internet what? What Scarlet and Scholarly magazines are you subscribing to? So, <laughs> this is it. so this was, you know, every outlet I saw it on, this was the headline. However, this is what actually was published. It was a study from 33 authors, and um, it was published on March 13th. So I don't know why it happened this week in the journal Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology. And the, the thesis was not that octopuses came here as fertilized eggs on a asteroid, but that the Cambrian explosion was the result of panspermia. And the panspermia was actually in the form of a virus that crashed on Earth in a meteor impact. So here's... So there yeah, were media there were meteor impacts at that point in time i mean that aha part, so that's part of where the the cambrian explosion right. came from right is like yes. you had a lot of animals die and then there was an explosion of other animals because yeah. of that yeah but so the cambrian explosion really quickly was around 540 million years ago it's the cambrian period and this it's known as the cambrian explosion because for about 20 to 25 million years there was this huge adaptive radiation where we went from pretty much all uh individual single-celled organisms that lived in colonies and then afterwards we got things like sea stars and jellyfish and octopuses and all these sorts of things most of the marine invertebrates came from this explosion and a lot of them are still around and so it's it's this singularly very interesting event in evolutionary history so one of the main authors of this paper was the individual who first proposed the hypothesis of panspermia in general in the 1970s. And they 
we're mainly pointing at the fact that octopuses have complex nervous systems, camera-like eyes, and this amazing camouflage. And that the genes for these adaptations, as per the paper, do not seem to have come from octopus ancestors. But, quote, it is plausible then to suggest that these traits seem to be borrowed from a far distant future in terms of terrestrial evolution, or more realistically, from the cosmos at large. So a couple of things just about that sentence um, uh -huh. is that just because you haven't seen some of these genes, that does not mean that your simplest, most plausible suggestion is that it was a virus from space. <laughs> Well, now, now, wait a second though. Let me let me just say that is that is how all of these conversations seem to take place though. Have you not like like huh? It seems very difficult to build something out of stone this large. Must be aliens. No humans could have achieved this task. Right. But why is there a why is there a straight line uh, cut into the desert? Yeah, it had to be it must be like, That's yep. like it's mm -hmm. the jump to conclusion of Absolutely. the thing. That you, want it to be. you would hope that this would not come from the scientific community, but here we are. Um, the real thing, though, that it's important to note is that when the octopus genome was mapped in 2015, they found that the octopus nervous system genes split from the squids 135 million years ago. So remember that Cambrian explosion. 540 million years ago. So their big explanation is that octopuses and squids are so different that it must have been a virus and there must have been this epigenetic change. And the only source of this epigenetic change has to have been from space. But we're seeing this- it couldn't have been here. Right, and we're along. seeing this stepwise change. So yes, there's this explosion the second you have multicellular organisms. That's not surprising. You have single-celled organism, organisms for millions and millions and millions and millions of years. And then you finally adapt to the point where you have multicellular organisms in a vast ocean. You're going to see adaptive radiation. That's going to happen. You're going to see every single possible kind of thing that could possibly be a multicellular organism underwater happen, and some of them will live and some of them will die. And that's how evolution works. Yeah, and it's so especially, especially in that, sorry, especially in that beginning stage where every niche of the uh -huh. ecosystem economy is available and free. It's just like homesteading anywhere on any piece of property you want. Mm -hmm. If you get there first, it's yours, right? Yeah, and, and so that's and it's the, and it's genomic. It's genetic homesteading. It's yes. the, it's yeah. the genes that allow that homesteading to take place. And so you have the mutation, you have the gene that allows you to do it. And so you get out there and take it over. And if you win, you survive. Yeah. And, and, and so one of the reasons say, the environment yeah. may inform the, the survival. We'll, we'll get into that some other day, but yeah. Exactly. So, and one of the reasons that octopuses are so different from other animals is that they are this evolutionary arm that was successful during the Cambrian explosion that has then continued to evolve for 540 million years. So of course you're going to see, it's like a genetic bottleneck. You're gonna see this huge runaway evolution of this one type of thing that of course you're gonna see vast differences from other lines because its root is so far deeper down the evolutionary tree. Um, one particular person who took issue with this um, was Ken Stedman, a virologist and professor of biology at Portland State University. Portland State, I've met him. We should have him on the show. He's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. This is my favorite yeah. point. For a virus, such as the RNA-based ones known as retroviruses, to somehow turn a squid into an octopus, as this paper would suggest, <laughs> that virus would have to evolve in a world where squids existed. Right. It would have to recognize something in the squid to be able to affect it to, yes, yeah. it would have to have a target within right. the squid to make yeah. the change. Wait. I will also say as a passing just comment that um, you can access the original paper online. Uh, there's no paywall that I found, but it 
reads like a science fiction novel. I did not see any data. I did not see any tables. I did not see anything that was an evaluative element of this thing. It was yep. mostly just kind of this narrative about in a world <laughs> where there's only single celled organisms and then there's an octopus. Surely it has to be from outer space. Don't call me yeah. Shirley. But this is this is one of those situations where you know people reported this as a study, yeah. and they're like, "Oh, this study suggests that octopus, no. the octopuses are aliens." It's like, no, it's not a study. It is a it's a research paper. They mm -hmm. used literature to mm -hmm. back up their ideas, but yeah. it's it is it's a it's a work of fiction based on their ideas. There's no <laughs> experiment. There's no study. Right. It's an idea. That's, I want them, yeah. if they're going to say this, they need to go back and get some proof. I want the data. Yeah. Well, and also I think the thing that was really lost is that the the whole idea of these octopus eggs hitching a ride was a sentence in this very long paper that was actually all about the Cambrian explosion, which if you kind of take the step Fair back enough. and look at that, then you really start to question the idea. Because if you're looking at adaptive radiation as a pattern and suggesting that you have to find an alternative source for each radiation, that becomes problematic. Anyway. Justin, oh, wait, are you going to say does something mean, else? Does that mean that it would require a different virus on a different <laughs> yeah. meteorite? fragment hitting every, earth for every evolutionary every change time. yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah that's kind of a that one's then it's a stretch it's get, it gets stickier for sure yeah. um moving on to the next occult story that i brought tonight it's all about yes. the loch ness monster oh nessie <laughs> that's not science you got some well science? actually Unless let me tell one. you Loch Ness Monster, again, is kind of just the headline and the and the fun thing to talk about here. But actually, this is a story about Loch Ness and the fact that um, the University of Otago, New Zealand, is actually going to start synthesizing environmental DNA, eDNA, from the waters of Loch Ness this summer. And they're very excited to see what they find. So the, the kind of the funny thing to talk about here is that if Nessie exists or ever did exist, she would have or he would have left behind skin, scales, feathers, fur, pee, poo, what have you, that has DNA in it. And from that, from these samples in Loch Ness over the next several months to years, they could figure out what or if she was. But really what's interesting about this <laughs> is that Loch Ness, I didn't know this, is actually, um, it is the largest freshwater lake uh, in the UK. It is the largest freshwater body in the UK. And they believe that under those murky depths are brand new species of life. They think they will find new species in there through their environmental DNA. They will find a whole bunch of new bacteria. They want to see data on invasive species because this is a lake or lock that has um, unfortunately had a lot of species purposefully and um, accidentally introduced like mm -hmm. Pacific pink salmon. And from all of this, they should be able to look at hundreds of thousands of different organisms in Loch Ness and get a good kind of idea of what's going on there. So one of the lead researchers says, we have the opportunity through this project to demonstrate the scientific process, how hypotheses are established and tested, the need to replicate, use controls and account for observer bias using double blind methodologies. These are all important parts of this story. So I actually awesome. offer this as a nice opposite to our first Animal Corner story, where they're taking a potentially um, uh, silly or extreme or fairy tale esque story, and they're going to use science as a learning opportunity in that case. That's great. I have a story very similar to this that I have at the very end of the show oh, that I bring up. But, yeah. I bet they find a ple plesiosaur. Then maybe. Who they knows? They certainly yeah. could. And that would be really cool if we could move forward and tell people that, you know, 
Nessie was a thing, but of course, and, the fact that she would still that. be alive when there were cameras right. would. Be How many likely. years old is she now? Oh my well, gosh. maybe there were two, and Nessie was the last one. Just dinosaurs lived forever. Yeah, maybe who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe for, you know, or maybe she was frozen in ice and bobbing on the surface of the water. It's anyway. One more quick story to close <sighs> out the corner, and it's all about tardigrades, the other aliens that can live forever. Yeah. and float through space yeah. so <laughs> whereas i do not think they actually are aliens i like to joke about that because they are so unusual and weird well here's a new thing to add to the weirdness of tardigrades their poop is huge so i'm playing a video if you're listening i encourage you to go to the show notes and watch this but there's this tardigrade and there's this mass <laughs> that's more than a third the length. I would and say the mass is approximately two thirds the length of the tardigrade. Wow. Here, I'm gonna play it yeah, again. Tardigrade is, you know, as you would imagine, a weird. <gasps> I mean, the water bear. You know, it's a weird, burbly-looking single-celled organism, and it ejects something from its body. Well, yeah, we're pretty sure it's poop. Um, but as far as we can tell, this is only the second uh, bowel movement, if we can even call it that, from a tardigrade ever uh, captured, let's say. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. And so this all I'm happened. A tardigrade hunter. <laughs> this, this, what is a wild? This all started from Tessa Montag, a recent PhD graduate from Harvard. She posted this video on Twitter and it exploded. Um, I loved seeing it. It's fascinating. And a quick check-in with her from Life Science um, actually wanted to ask about how often tardigrades poop. And her answer was, I have no idea. <laughs> um, because this is the second time ever that they've seen it. Are their poops always big? Her, her answer was yes, but our sample size is two. So the two times they've seen it, the poops have been huge. And um, what are they made of? Well, tardigrades eat lichens, algae, etc. So it was probably partially digested lichen. And in full color, the poop was bright green. So bright green. So yeah, yeah that would make sense. Mm -hmm. So just add to the list of tardigrades being amazing and weird and fascinating is that they have giant poops. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Maybe it's part of how they survive maybe. so well. I also, maybe, maybe they're would... camera shy. Maybe they've just been building it up because they don't want to poop on camera. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's possible. These, all these things are possible, right? No, I would. I would imagine that um, maybe part of you know their ability to survive and to deal with radiation and all the things. Maybe their metabolism and their excretory system. Mm -hmm is highly advanced for getting rid of stuff. So yeah. maybe that's a big part of why it was, why they have such large excrement. Yeah. And if you think about animals that eat plants, right, they, a lot of times animals that eat only plants will eat their own poop later because plants are really hard to digest and there's partially digested plants in their poop. And so maybe, maybe. it stays in there and builds up because they're extracting as much as they possibly can from it. Who That's knows? Possible too. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe we'll learn someday more about tardigrade poop. <laughs> but not tonight. Tonight, not tonight we have other things that we're going to talk about. But first, we're going to take a break. So everyone out there, thank you for joining us. So far, we have a bunch of other cool science news coming up. We got brains and other things, and we will see you after the break. Stay tuned for more this week in science. <laughs> Things you've heard more than intuition. The libraries that shows the way to go. New conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need.
Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for watching This Week in Science. Thank you for listening. If you are listening right now, thank you for being a part of our audience and being a part of this show week after week after week. And we do enjoy bringing you this show every week. But part of what we do and how we do it is the fact that we are listener supported, that we are supported by you. You help us bring the show to you. So all of our costs and labor are supported by you. So how can you help This Week in Science? Well, number one, you can subscribe. What? Is it that easy? Yes, it is. Go to YouTube, go to iTunes, go to Google and subscribe to This Week in Science. Uh, and that will help increase our numbers. And the more people listening, more people watching, the better, right? Now, all of you, if you can't remember all those things I just said, just go to twist twis.org. That's our website, uh, twist.org. You can click on the big orange subscribe button and the big orange subscribe button will take you to the various places to subscribe if that's what you'd like to do. Also, if you want to just financially help out, say you're already subscribed and you, you're, you're like, I want a t-shirt. How do I get a t-shirt? Well, you go to the twist.org website, click on the Zazzle store link, and that will take you to our Zazzle store where you will be able to find all sorts of products that have the twist logo on them, like t-shirts or mugs or mouse pads. We even have some polo shirts for those of you who'd like to wear something a little bit more professional than a t-shirt. There are also many items with art from previous Blair's Animal Corner calendars. So there is a mammoth lumbar pillow, which I think is just fabulous and everybody should have one of those. <laughs> There's also baby onesies. Do you know somebody who's having a baby and they need a little T-Rex or tortoise in their life? That's right. They need some Blair's Animal Corner. You can get a baby bodysuit with twist images on it also. Lots of fun things over there at the Zazzle store. If you just click on that link and then peruse, you might find, find something that you like and the, the portion of the proceeds help twist. Go back to twist.org if you want to find a different way to help us out. One way, click on that donate button that is on the right sidebar. It says donate. You can click on it and it will take you to a page that you can enter an amount and just donate. Now, if you're not into PayPal, which is how that platform is supported, you can also click on Patreon. Patreon in the upper header bar. Patreon link will take you to our Patreon page where you can click and become a supporter at whatever level of support per month you choose. So you can just help us out at $1 a month because that's a dollar more than we had before. And it really comes out to about a quarter an episode there. If you help us out at say $5 a month, you'll get a whole bunch of things, sticker, a button, a twist patch, we'll send them to you. And that's about maybe a dollar, maybe a dollar 25 an episode right there. Not too bad. You pay more for coffee probably every day than you would at $5 a month, our baryonic level of support. But there are many levels. You want to help us out? How about $1,000 a month? That'd be one. That would be something we'd be super happy with. You have the resources for that? Oh, yes. That's, that would be awesome. Support us at $1,000 a month. That would definitely help us meet our goals for supporting the show. In any case, twist.org is where you go to find all of these links, find all of the ways to subscribe or to support us or to find the latest episodes. And if uh, you know people who haven't subscribed to Twist yet, send them on over to twist.org because that'll be a great place for them to start. And for you, Thank you. Once again, thank you for all of your support. We really could not do this without you. Can't explain things you've heard more than intuition. The libraries have shown the way. And we're back with more This Week in Science. Yes, we are. And on This Week in Science right now, it is time for This Week in What Has Science Done for Me Lately? Lately. All right. Walter Gunn wrote in and left a comment on the Twist website. And he said, 
Being a TWIS fan, I herewith submit my twistament to the role of science in my life. Though no scientist nor having training beyond college courses, I totally rely on science as a practicing visual artist. As oh, do you all are a scientist. <laughs> as do all creatives, whether recognized or not. Geometry, geology, mineralogy, and engineering, and physics at all are required to make and maintain the machinery and tools to work steel and wood, fiber, stone, paint, and clay. Likewise, the role of chemistry and atmospherics in the mastery of pigments and finishes all via the artisan empower the object itself, its life expectancy, and interaction with light and space. Science, like art, animates the what if spurs possibilities, teaches by mistake, and demands we build upon and with truth. Walter, thank you so much for writing in. I really appreciate this 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 comment and this sentiment. I mean there, yeah. And Justin, you know, you're an artist as well. Well, so here's and here's the thing, Walter, I will say that, uh, that at least in the practice of uh, making art and a lot of the materials that you're, especially that you're describing, uh, you have to experiment quite a bit. And then when you hit upon something that you really like, you want to be able to recreate it. So you, you take notes on how you got there, what you did, how you put it together so that you can recreate it. That's the act of, of doing research right there. I mean, that's, it's the same practice. It's the same skill sets it's the same methodologies that come into play um so i would i would say that yeah you are doing uh, a scientific method in creating your art it's the same thing yeah and it's wonderful for everyone to be reminded of that that art and science are intertwined and intermingled and near nigh inseparable inseparable let's see if i can use words tonight <laughs> all of you thank you for your words but you need to keep them coming we need your sentiments we need your comments we need your emails we need your messages you need to send them to me tell me what science has done for you lately leave us a message at facebook our facebook page facebook.com slash this week in science or email me kirsten k-i-r-s-t-e-n at this week in science.com i want to keep this show this part of the show going because it seems to be something that everyone appreciates i enjoy all of them i yeah. really do they're also they're different which yeah. gets me well, it's that personal aspect. I, that's yeah. what I love. Is it's this is these these are the people who listen to the show. This is this is who these we are do your the show fellow for. minions. Yeah, this is just, this a is beautiful all of us. tapestry. Yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> We're all connected, Justin. Uh, I got a uh, segment that uh, we haven't done in a while, but we seem to hit upon at least uh, every other week. This weekend, the end of the world. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Failing to cap global warming at two degrees Celsius or less could cost the world economy tens of trillions of dollars over the next 80 years, researchers warn. Four out of five countries, 90% of the global population would see major economic benefits by avoiding costs linked to higher temperatures. This is reported in the journal Nature. Such costs stem from more frequent and severe extreme weather, lower yields in agriculture, negative health impacts. The 196 nation Paris Climate Treaty calls for holding the rise in Earth's surface temperature to well under two degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And if possible, 1.5 degrees Celsius. The lower target was included of uh, was included in light of severe climate impacts predicted after only one degree Celsius of warming, uh, including deadly heat waves, droughts, storm surges uh, made more destructive by rising seas. UN special report due in October will likely detail damage in a 1.5 C world and help leaders decide if the targets that they have now are within reach. But few efforts have been made to quantify the impact of different temperature goals on long-term economic growth. Cody Voice, uh, achieving the more ambitious Paris goals is highly likely to benefit most countries, 
and the global economy overall by avoiding more severe economic damage, says senior author Noah Diffenbaugh, a professor at Stanford University School of Earth. Over the course <laughs> of the century, the global economy in a 1.5 degree Celsius increase world would generate an additional $20 trillion in GDP compared to one in which the temperature rose by two degrees Celsius. That's a half a degree difference in global temperature, $20 trillion in GDPs. GDP is not a necessarily an indicator of economic health of all the people, but it's, you know, something that can be figured out. <laughs> so, uh, but that's, uh, that is, of course, if we are in for a 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius change, as in a different story, researchers just published their analysis projecting a doubling of the 2 degrees Celsius increase by 2085. Uh, that's in the uh, Advances in Atmospheric Sciences, or is published. In the analysis, the team used the parameters of no mitigation of rising greenhouse emissions. So they're predicting uh, Paris Climate Accord decide nothing changes. We just keep going the way that we're going. They compared, uh, they didn't do their own individual study. What they actually did was a comparison of, of other data. They compared 39 coordinated climate model experiments from something called the fifth phase of the coupled model intra comparison project, which develops and reviews climate models to ensure the most accurate climate simulations possible. They found that most of the models projected an increase of four degrees Celsius as early as 2064. That's the majority saying 2064 and as late as uh, 2095. So they picked 2084. Uh, I guess that was their, their, you know, finding something sort of, you know, eh, some mitigation the takes place. <laughs> Apparently everybody signed the accord except for the United States and maybe Venezuela. Uh, but but uh, so they're assuming, okay, well, we'll go we'll with the number where some mitigation does take place. But even then, eh, 2084. Meanwhile, meanwhile, in another completely unrelated story, although the subject matter is uh, topically similar, uh, Increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will reduce the nutritional value of rice, according to an international research team that's analyzing rice samples from field experiments started by a University of Tokyo professor. Uh, there's a good portion of the population on Earth that uses rice as, a, as their you know, staple crop. And then completely random side note to that, one of that professor's, uh, Tokyo professor's uh, banes in doing his research was apparently raccoons that kept raccoons. chewing through <laughs> tubes that were designed to carry uh, the increased CO2 to the, to the plants as they grew and uh -huh. had an issue with raccoons chewing through the tubes. Totally unrelated, but uh, maybe. Oh, maybe the, the, trouble, the, the troubles researchers have to deal with. Maybe, maybe the raccoons don't want us to know what's coming. Maybe they've <laughs> already got a plan for dealing with a 4C world. Yeah. No, oh my gosh. Yeah. Rice is a huge su subsistence crop around the world. It maintains the nutrition for many diets. For people around the world and if it has lowered nutrition that means more people are going to have nutritional issues and there's going to be higher levels of starvation yeah. so that's not good it's not or, a good at, thing. Least, or, or at least malnutrition right. and that's so, what's sort of interesting that, that this study was uh, the professor was in tokyo who was doing this study but from when he started doing his studies till now uh the the people of japan have become much less reliant on rice uh, huh. as, a, as a staple, uh, but but it's in in some places in the world it's it's as much as fifty percent of, of the what diet. they're eating. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what else is really important for food is uh, insects. And while we're talking about this 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius change, I'm just going to hop in with one of my quick stories, which is uh, is very interesting that it also dropped this week. This is actually published in Science from the University of East Anglia. And it's about uh, a limiting of global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, focusing on insects specifically. And they found that... Uh, 
looking at the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius, they actually looked at 115,000 species, including 31,000 insects, 8,000 birds, 1,700 mammals, 1,800 reptiles, 1,000 amphibians, and 71,000 plants in this large scale study. And they found that um, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels would reap enormous benefits for biodiversity. So this is kind of the uh, glass half full side of this story is that, hey, if we limit it, we're actually going to be okay. Uh, and they found that at two degrees warming, 18% of insects will have more than half of their range lost, but at 1.5 degrees Celsius, only 6% will be lost. Um, scaling that up at three degrees Celsius, about 50% of insects would lose half of their range. So this is a situation where, you know, insects kind of important to most food that we eat. <laughs> um, that 1.5 degrees Celsius is really that critical space. And if you know, if you, you're not so worried about that, uh, black rhinos, Darwin's finches, these are also animals that really that 1.5 degrees Celsius is a um, watermark it's looking like for them. And and you bring up a good point and, and that's a, it's something that I've left out of all of my 1.5, 2 degree, 4 degree Celsius is that those temperatures aren't like 1.5 more than we are now. That's 1.5, 2 or 4 from uh, the pre-industrial. Pre so like 1890. Yeah. This is like yeah. compared to 1890 temperatures. So we've already done a lot of the progress towards that at this point. Yes. So, so these this isn't additional on top of what's already happened. This is uh, it, in, not including mm -hmm. what's already happened. I think mean, yes, but I think what also is important here is to remember that we're not already sunk. So it's this idea that that's that researchers are really finding that that specific threshold and that we're not already past the point of no return. We have to limit where we move towards right now, but it's not too late. That's what I took away. That's from what you took this. away. I looked and I looked at all my fellow humans and went, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to change. Well, we'll see when it starts to affect food and global diversity. It's, it's something that, I mean, that's why the, the Paris Accords happened. And, you know, we don't yet know what the results of that is it's still really early so it's i choose really hope. early yeah but we don't know exactly what's going to happen eric holdhouse this last week on uh actually just yesterday on twitter i ran across a tweet of his he it, he is a climate uh reporter and he he has been known to go to the extreme end of the sky is falling kind of reporting um but on his on his uh recent he recently wrote an article on grist.org about a building El Nino for 2018. We still don't know exactly what's going to happen, but that there are signs of an El Nino coming again, which oh my is kind of unprecedented. Yeah. And he says in his, in his tweet, he says, if El Nino a lot arrives in late 2018, and it's looking like it might next year, might tiptoe across the 1.5 degree Celsius mark next year right but it's also so, it's not it's not once you're over it it's not over there's know, still this there's there's wiggle yeah, room and yeah, it goes yeah. up and it goes down and the t yeah. you know this is this is it's, it's not over until the until the last human goes <gasps> yeah but, which but, which i think but, is the important thing here also is that we know again from social science research bringing it back to the science right that the second that um people think that there's no fixing something they stop caring and they won't do anything about it right. so, so we so must that continue also to is lie big, to people no it's <laughs> actually similar <laughs> research that that hope, to hope results in behavior change and better outcomes so that's also a big part of it so people that think that we're already past the point of no return and people that think that there is no hope they have no reason to be invested or care so i choose hope we're not past the point of no return mm. there are possibilities there are things we can do and in fact there was news in in terms of hope in california this last week um it was reported that since the coal and natural gas uh, power plants went offline, the number of uh, of of um, I think it's uh, the number of uh, pre of premature births has decreased hmm. in California. 
So it's uh, there's a there's a correlation between the reduction in coal power plants and coal pro- coal processing and cleaner air and healthier babies, nice. healthier pregnancies. Um, awesome. Yeah, and and there is other other news that it, it it is becoming less financially feasible for things like coal yeah. to work, and so even though the price of solar and wind has been going down, um, it, the, the, the price of coal has been going up. And so more, more solar and more wind are being put into use. So we have things in action and steps are being taken. Hope. Absolutely. Hope. And we can all get rid of plastic straws. Thank you, McDonald's. Yeah. Yes. Um, wait, in- what? <laughs> hey, wait, 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 no, you can't just throw that by me. Like, I, I didn't hear the plastic straw story. So now you got to tell me about it. Yes. Yeah, so McDonald's is signing on to the uh, uh, the movement to get rid of plastic straws. Straws are the worst. Yes. And it's this is a fast food company who hands you your, your oh. beverage through a window with the plastic straw, with the plastic lid. I don't know what they're going to do to replace it, but they are taking it seriously, and uh, they're going, they're going to be signing on to getting rid of plastic straws. They're probably going to sell five dollar McDonald's reusable straws or something like that, and end up making Keep it in your car. a huge amount of money because everyone will forget their straws. Wait. So <laughs> it'll work like out for you. Bags. Yeah, yeah, but um, I think that that's a really good point. Is that the plastic bags? not to go too far on a tangent, but the plastic bag ban has worked really well and is gaining more and more momentum and less and less plastic bags are entering our environment every day. And so once that success has been shown and is still continuing to grow, it's giving people hope that they can stop other terrible things from entering the environment, i.e. microbeads, straws, plastic utensils, more and more of those things are becoming the norm. And I, I'm really, I'm inspired by how far we've come in just a few years with that. More work into the future, of course, but other areas in which researchers are trying to help humanity is in helping the brain heal from the damage from stroke. So when people uh, suffer stroke, there is a blockage of blood supply, which blocks oxygen getting to uh, nerve cells and other cells in the brain. And those cells can sometimes die. And so after a stroke, uh, a patient has to deal with maybe uh, reduced mental capacity, reduced behavioral abilities because of basically scars in their brain, areas of the brain where there's dead tissue, where there's nothing there. And even though the human brain is plastic and that some some recovery can be made over time, it's very slow going. And the question has been, how can we help that along? Well, some researchers at UCLA, just publishing in Nature Materials, have created what they're calling a stroke healing gel. It is a hydrogel that can be implanted into the brain and uh, helps brain cells grow back. And so they were able to uh, implant it into these scarred regions of mice who had been damaged by strokes. And the uh, brain tissue and blood vessels started returning to the cavity after the hydrogel was injected into the cavity. So this hydrogel it thickens into something of a scaffold so that neurons and blood blood vessels can grow through it. And it's infused with medications that actually stimulate that growth and suppress inflammation, which inflammation often reduces that regrowing and results in scars. After 16 weeks in these mouse brains, the stroke cavities contained regenerated brain tissue, including new neuronal contact connections this has never been seen before uh-huh. and the the abilities of the mice were improved they were able to reach for food better uh, which is a sign of improved motor behavior uh, but they don't know exactly how that was working because they you know weren't actually in the brain seeing the neurons connect and knowing that that was what was allowing the behavior to be improved but they think that maybe new axons could be working and allowing the motor behavior in the mice. So um, they're going to be testing this in humans to see uh, 
how long it'll take. They think that uh, this in in mice they could in they could inject it following a stroke over a period of about five days after a stroke, and they think that this period might be longer in humans, maybe up to two months after a stroke, that they could uh, be able to inject this and help with recovery. So, wow, we'll that's see. awesome! Yeah. So, so this. I don't know why, but this created this, this wild speculation within me. <laughs> don't know how that happened. Uh, you? What? That some point in the distant future, we could uh, remove parts of our brain and regenerate it afresh, anew. And, and the first thing that came to my mind is, well, what if you're a professional athlete? And you've been professional athleting your whole life, remembering the plays. You've got the motor skills for the, but, but then you get to an age where none of that's useful anymore. None of what you've trained for and worked on and done your entire life is, is really pertinent to your now day-to-day -day life because you're physically unable to do what you used to do. What if you could just sort of wipe out a bunch of the brain circuitry that's been dedicated to this and regrow it afresh anew? with these new connections that you can make. Or like you just change jobs, you change industries, you do something different completely than you, the path you run. Uh, criminals could choose this as a path to re-entering society afresh and new. Everything I've been doing was wrong. Therapy. You're talking about reprogramming, ah. wiping oh, the hard drive. But it's like getting a fresh brain to, to, to fill with uh, experiences and neural connections and knowledge. Yeah, I mean, it would definitely would not be easy. I mean, it would have to be, you'd be going back to the drawing board on how the connections work and what connections are made. And, um, and, and you know, what depending people, on, I mean, we're talking about networks in the brain, working with other networks in the brain. People with and, mental illnesses that have been, yeah. been prevented I mean, them from. Like I think more, I think more specifically, maybe this, I mean, this could help with stroke, but I mean, could this help with, uh, with traumatic brain and injury, like for boxers or football players, you know, um, you know, could it be something that after, schizophrenia. you know, too many, too many, uh, no, it's schizophrenia. Cause that is, that's brain wide. And it is going to be, that's at a molecular level. That's not just, we can give you new tissue and it's going to be okay. Well, if, if it's molecular I mean, and it's new tissue, why wouldn't it be okay? I mean, there's, I mean, it'd have to be your tissue. And so, yeah. yes, so there you're talking about in something uh, like schizophrenia, yeah. you'd have to go, I mean, that's a lot of mutations that are responsible no, for the disorder and it's, I, you'd have to fix all of them and then implant the tissue fixed and mm -hmm. that this is a very, but I think, yeah, there could be sections of the brain. So say, you know, an accident, maybe it's not stroke, but maybe there's something that leads to, you know, aphasia where suddenly you're unable to understand speech or you're not able to speak, mm -hmm. but then we can replace that brain area, put the new brain tissue in there and then teach you to speak again or teach you to understand it. Um, yeah, there, yeah, the potential there is very, it's interesting. So yes, this is in mice. We'll see how it works in people. But it, the fact that this hydrogel worked and they had new brain connections, I mean, that's exciting. I, I so, like the idea of overwriting some of the hard drive. <laughs> I know there's- This is in science fiction. All right, tell me about raccoon thing. lizard cats. Okay. Yeah, let's get down to some hard <laughs> science, shall we? <laughs> yeah. oh, boy. This is an earth-shattering discovery I get found it. in Utah. <laughs> it's not really necessarily earth-shattering. It's more landmass separation and how that relates to our understanding of mammalian evolution in a sort of shattering of what we understood before kind of way. Nearly uh, 130 million-year-old fossilized skull found in Utah is evidence that Pangea, the supercontinental uh, one continent for all life, split uh, occurred more recently than scientists previously thought. Huh. And uh, that the, uh, and that this, and that a group of reptile like mammals these creatures who are sort of transitioning from reptile to mammal, somewhere in the middles there, 
They experienced an unsuspected burst of evolution across several continents. Must have been aliens. <laughs> of course. Uh, Quotey voice of Adam Huttenlocker. Based on the unlikely discovery of this near complete fossil cranium, we now recognize a new cosmopolitan group of early mammal relatives. Uh, Adam is uh, Huttenlocker is the lead author of the study, assistant professor of clinical integrative anatomical sciences at Keck School of Medicine at USC. This is published in the journal Nature. The study updates our understanding of how mammals evolved and dispersed across major continents during the age of the dinosaurs. For a long time, we thought early mammals from the Cretaceous, which is 145 to 66 million years ago time range, were anatomically similar to each other and not ecologically diverse. This finding by our team and others reinforced that even before the rise of modern mammals, ancient relatives of mammals were exploring specialty niches. Insectivores, herbivores, carnivores, swimmers, gliders, indestructible pants. Basically, they were <laughs> occupying a variety of niches that we see them occupy today. A study reveals that early mammal precursors migrated from Asia to Europe into North America and further into the major southern continents. Really interesting find here, though. This is, oh, the, the new species, which I don't know if you can get a screen share of this thing. But it is like a raccoon cat fox thing. It's a really uh, pretty cool looking critter. Its name of the new species is Cephleodon wakarum. <laughs> I can't say it. Wakarum uh, which is a. Uh, Cephleodon wakarmusuch. Wakarmusuch which means yes. yellow cat in the Ute tribe's language in respect for the area where the creature was found. It was found in the Cretaceous beds of eastern Utah. And that's sort of where a lot of this tie into the Pangaea split comes in. Because this critter, they find, is most closely related. The closest thing they've found to this, the closest relative, is during around in, in the early Cretaceous. But it's it's not in North America. It's in Northern Africa. Huh. And it sort of it slims down the idea that the dispersing continents, then you would see dispersed uh, sort of evolution taking place in different places. And then that would make sense because they were not connected. But if you have these, these very similar creatures in what are now very different parts of the world, it's harder to make that argument. And I guess it backs up some other sort of recent finds this year within the dinosaur fossils uh, in Africa and Europe that kind of hint at the same uh, much more recent separation of Pangaea. Hmm. But uh, yeah, this little guy, uh, huh, he had, it says it had, had teeth similar to fruit eating bats. Hmm. Uh, they, so they're with their teeth. They could nip, shear and crush. Uh, it might've been an omnivore. Had a small brain, which well, most everything that's not human, we say that about. Uh, <laughs> and it had giant olfactory bulbs. So it had really good sense of smell. It focused a lot on smell. And the uh, skull has tiny uh, eye sockets. So it probably didn't have good eyesight, may not have had color vision, possibly nocturnal, because uh, good sense of smell and bad eyes. Why not just go out at night if you're rel relying on your, your sense of smell? Plus, maybe the dinosaurs, <laughs> being a little on the cold-blooded side, uh, might not be out and active in such force at night. It might be a good time for the mm -hmm. mammals. This might be the nocturnal thing. It all comes down to mammals trying to avoid when dinosaurs were very active, right? But the, yeah, did you find it? Did you? Uh, I didn't see if you screen shared. I, was like, I did. It. There? You know what it looks like to me is a coati, which is a thing that lives in South America. <laughs> It looks a lot like it, actually. Um, but I trust That's the true. I trust the biologists here and their categorization. Wait, what is it? What's the their categorization? Uh, that they are most similar to something that isn't in the Americas. Oh, oh, but but also also really really long time ago. This is so this right. is a this is sort of a dead family tree. 
This is apparently not an actual ancestor of anything living today. This is an mm -hmm. extinct branch uh, right. of creature. So it's not related to anything. Oh, my gosh. It looks very much like that. Yes. That's um, what, the first thing I thought of was a kawadi, which is basically a South American raccoon. Yeah. So this is this is. Uh, so the kawadi worked out in South America. This other one yeah. split off. It ended up someplace else and didn't work very well. Yeah. So Utah. maybe it maybe it has to do with predators and habitat and yeah. you know maybe the kawadi was just well adapt. It is a uh -huh. well adapted for that South American e ecosystem that habitat yeah. and then. Maybe the, better at climbing trees. Yeah, I mean, there's Maybe probably better. something that would that made the difference. But that's fascinating that the body type and so much can look so similar, yet they can be completely different fates. Time yeah, and place. And, yeah, and it's uh, it's it, the fact that the only subspecies of this was also found in North Africa is, is again part of what that. But I think they might that might be the creature they said. Uh, oh, I'm trying to find it now. They said it was it's only two and a half pounds uh the this it was this, little right yeah mm -hmm. it's a it's a little guy but what did they compare it to they might have actually compared compared it to that critter your, your, the kawada uh, yeah uh, they said it was like the size of a small hair but no uh, yeah i can't find it here oh yeah here it is All uh, right. oh no they compared it to a pika know, that's weird that's a rodent that is a rodent yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, because, in terms because, of size, in terms of size, mm, but, of size. but, but, they're but very this, different. at two and a half pounds, it would have been at its time, one of the biggest mammals. Mm -hmm, it right. would have been the right. thunder mammal of its time mm -hmm. at that That's size. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is small now was very large then. That's really interesting. So much to think about. How about thinking about some hammerhead worms? Say what? Not a hammerhead shark, but a hammerhead worm. I'm intrigued. Tell me more. <laughs> you should be intrigued because this story is actually very intriguing. Uh, researchers in France had gotten a couple of reports over the years about these weird worms. In, in people's gardens. And there was this one, one guy who kept sending these worms to this lab. And the, the scientist was like, Psh, that didn't come from France. We are French. This is not a French worm. This is not something that you would find in our gardens. And so he just pooed it as he pooed you know. it. <laughs> It did. And but then the reports kept coming. And finally, the researcher said, OK, let's really take a look at this. And so uh, the group, the, the researchers got a bunch of um, of citizen science observations. They got observations from 1999 to 2017. They did a four year wow. survey to get these uh, these observations, a total of 111 records. And they were able to determine that there has been an invasion in France and that indeed France has been taken over by the hammerhead flatworm. Sacre bleu! Sacre bleu! Platyhelminthes geoplanidae by pallium. Diversa bipallium. These are uh, worm species that uh, of the species of the genera bipallium, diversa bipallium. Um, they are among the land planarians, these flatworms. And normally you think of planarians as kind of these water living flatworm type things. But these planarians, they're giants and they live in the land. And normally they live in Asia, but now they've invaded other places and it's scary because they're predator predators they eat earthworms they secrete a uh, they secrete a paralyzing toxin that allows them to uh, basically subdue and kill their earthworm prey but earthworms they, make soil yeah do and they, do they this the is the, job that the earthworm does nope Oh, they do not do the same job as the earthworm. And in fact, 
in uh, the uh, the records of their activity and the uh, the invasion of these worms, they've actually shown that there has been a decrease in earthworm populations in the areas where these invasions have taken place, okay. and also that uh, that soil quality and formation has decreased in those areas. Mm. These worms are bad news. You know, they mm. these worms. These worms have been found in Florida because uh -oh. that's where everything invades first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but you know what likes to eat them? Cane what? toads. Cane toads. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> no, cane toads like to eat, uh, well, small birds. mice, birds. Bullfrogs like to eat small turtles. Yeah, <laughs> but something needs to stop these flatworms. These flatworms are huge they can be um they can be pretty long they're giants oh, in the yeah. modern world there's they're... 20 inches in in this picture whoa yeah. that's too big yeah. that's way yeah. too big for worms so, and so what we need is they can they can reproduce by fission but yes they can just split because they're planarians they can just yeah. split and form new worms hey uh -oh. i think i need to just Make a new worm. Cut myself in half there. There we go. Yeah. Rut row. I think they're from space. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll That's the, the name theme name. tonight. It's probably from space. It's, prob it's not from space. It's from Asia. Yeah. <laughs> they and they are a scourge. Um, and especially for gardens, for gardeners, for people who are concerned about. The soil, and I know there's been a lot of talk about uh, about the soil and our loss of it because of our poor agricultural practices globally. We're losing our ground soil for various reasons. Um, this is this is a not great news. So um, yeah, predatory think... flatworms, hammerhead flatworms. It's like scary hammerhead sharks, except they're worms. <laughs> How do they think they got there? Do they think they hitched a ride on a, on a plant or somebody's shoe? Or in soil. Yeah, somebody bringing a plant from Asia. I mean, there's so many ways uh, I, I that know. these I mean, could spread. You think of a normal worm and you think it moves real slow. Like, you know. Well, it's not. It's, it's things... 20 inches long. I mean, it might be able to outrun a toddler. <laughs> right. Right. These things have not walked around the country they have been moved by the physical movements of people and yeah, the things plants, that yeah. and plants and soil mm -hmm. uh and so it, yeah things that people have done and you know who knows it's been potentially you know you even have soil with eggs in it that you're bringing a plant from asia and it's got you know even just the eggs of these things and then they can hatch and anyway full-blown invasion I, I french invasion point, i think there's a point where you have to start taking ecosystem sides and and right. you have to take our latest technologies and and start doing that that what normally takes nature a long time is is that sort of uh interplay between predator and prey back and forth that that arms race that goes on yeah. normally and say, you know what? We can make and rebuild a better earthworm. We can make them bigger. We can make them stronger. We can make them resist, resist this neurotoxic behavior, this paralysis thing. Right. And now, right now, all of our earthworms, they're just sad, defenseless little earthworms who yeah. don't know what's coming to attack them. It's just like a horror movie. Samurai sort of some sort of molecular level version of to combat and defend themselves. Let's do the arms race. Like there, there is a thing where at some point you kind of have to start making those decisions, isn't there? You have to be careful though, because if you if you in, you know raise them with some sort of inedible poison, then before you know it, there are worms everywhere. They overpopulate and their population but, crash. So okay, but how how often have you heard like, ah, oh, I've got too many earthworms in my garden. I really got them. It's because everything eats them. Yeah, there's really good population control. Yeah, everything likes to eat the earthworm. Yeah. Well, you know what likes to eat us mosquitoes and. Yeah. I, you hear the story very often that people who get bitten, they're like, I don't know why the mosquitoes like me so much. I get bitten all the time, you know, and some people are like that and other people are not. And then some people 
in addition to just being like candy for mosquitoes, they also have a bad immune response. Some people mm -hmm. end up with welts and these huge swollen bites for mm -hmm. weeks sometimes. And, you know, nobody ever really talks about why that is. But now some researchers at Baylor College of Medicine have looked at the effect of mosquito saliva all by mm. itself. And this is the, I can't believe this is the first time anybody's looked at this, but this is the first time that researchers have discovered that just mosquito saliva with nothing else, no malaria in it, like nothing, nothing, <laughs> no parasite. No, no, no proboscis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just the saliva can trigger an, uh, an immune response in the human immune system. Hmm. And so this is published in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases Journal, the Public Library of Science. Uh, they, it, this was again, some, this is one of those studies where they were like, oh, I don't, we weren't really looking for this, but we saw an effect and they used humanized mice. Uh, and they, uh, they were at first looking at mosquito bite delivery and needle injection delivery of dengue virus. Uh, to significantly different disease developments. Uh, and, and they saw that if it was a needle injection, the dengue virus had one effect. And if it was a mosquito bite, it was different. And the mosquitoes delivering the virus, the mice had more of a rash, more fever, and mother more characteristics that were similar to the disease presentation in humans. Because humans aren't going around going, hey, can you give me a needle full of dengue? They're just getting bitten by mosquitoes. So they went in to look at this more specifically, and they found that uh, 24 hours and seven days after mosquitoes bite m humanized mice, uh, they were able to look at the levels of cytokines, which are inflammatory molecules, and they modulate the immune response. And they looked at other immune cells. And they found that they were all upgraded just from mosquito-delivered saliva. So there is a complex immune reaction that was not anticipated from mosquito saliva. And so since it's an immune reaction, I am going to jump to the conclusion. This was not part of what they said in the study, but this is an immune response. And so I'm going to jump to the conclusion that some people are going to have a more heightened immune response than others to mosquito saliva. A akin to an allergy? Akin to an allergy, yeah. Akin to where it would lead to um, a longer lasting immune response, a more swelling, more itching, maybe a rash. And uh, so, uh, yeah. hey, science is finally telling you people who have been saying forever, I don't know why I swell up and I get these huge reactions when I get bitten by mosquitoes. Yeah, you do, because yeah. mosquitoes, so you're allergic to mosquito spit. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. You're you're actually allergic to mosquito spit. <laughs> um, and then my final story, talking about the uh, this story we've we've brought up on the show before, the EM drive, which is one of these magical thrusters that uh, multiple. I think there were some Germans and Chinese and NASA researchers who've been trying to create. Um, thrusters that could be lightweight, not have to use a whole bunch of fuel, but be able to get us across the solar system um, easily. They're looking for these new ways to drive spacecraft across the universe. And um, the AEM drive came out in the last year or two as this really interesting, weird thing that was like a black box, that there was thrust involved, and they don't know how it worked. Well, it turns out it didn't work because it didn't work. And uh, I'm going back to you. <laughs> it, this is then, and I, and I'm going back to your uh, story from the your animal corner, Blair, about how uh, the researchers were doing this this setup. And you know, oh, we also just want to look for the Loch Ness monster because this is also a teaching thing. We can teach yeah. about science, and we can do all this stuff. Well, for this particular story. A team of Germans were like, okay, 
we need to figure out what's going on here. And so they created this really neat experimental testing box to test these cool new space drives and see how they work and see if they work. And so they create it with it. It's got a vacuum. So it'll be like the vacuum of space and they've got it automated so that they can set things to run on their own and they've got calibrations and all sorts of balancing and everything to make it as finely tuned as possible and it's sensitive the system is sensitive to around 10 nanonewtons of force which is not very much force anyway they tested this eam drive they built their own and they tested it and they determined that what's happening is uh the eam drive is just sensitive to the earth's magnetic field and that the thrust that the drive was showing is not really thrust at all, but actually noise from oh, the Earth's no. magnetic field. Yeah. Um, and then they oh. did this again. They tried again on something called a mock effect thruster, which is a different kind of thruster that's um, based on kind of vibrations. And so they built kind of this piezo uh, powered um, vibrating system to get it to work and again it didn't really work and they don't really they, they couldn't figure it there's something interesting going on there but they couldn't figure it out entirely but really what they did is they created a really cool setup and system for testing these things really well and they're very excited about their opportunity and the research researchers conclusions from all of this is that at least space drive which is the name of the test setup is an excellent educational project by developing highly demanding test setups, evaluating theoretical models, and possible experimental errors. It's a great learning experience with the possibility to find something that can drive space exploration into its next generation. Great. So testing That's tool awesome. is also a teaching tool. Yeah. Yeah. And this uh my this this art this article that I uh took that quote from is written by Chris Lee over at Ars Technica. And seriously, he has the best sense of humor about this whole thing. I mean, in the beginning of the uh, in the beginning of this article, he instead of calling it the EM drive, he calls it the WTF thruster. And then he goes on <laughs> and then he goes on to say, oh, where did it go? Where did it go? Um, Oh, and then he goes on to talk about how um, things in space that can't be powered by magical unicorns or something. He starts talking about magical space unicorns at some point in the article. and That just shows his lack of knowledge of magical yeah. space unicorns. I mean, I mean, there's no evidence that it's That's not it magical space unicorns, so Which maybe it, it is. It has to be magical space maybe, unicorns. Maybe I'll grab 30 of my friends and we'll write a, a, a paper about magical <laughs> space unicorns. That's right. Get 30 of your friends and write a paper, and there you go. That's right. Oh, here it is. He had the thruster, the radiation bounces around the cone, and by some physics-defying magic, unicorns materialize to push you through space. Yeah, no, that doesn't happen. No. Yeah, physics, everybody. Physics is what it boils down to. Does anyone else have any amazing articles they want to quickly run through before the end of the show? Oh, yeah. Speaking of uh, testing and teaching, the African Matabele ants, Mega Panera Analis, we've talked about them on the show before. They're the termite eating ants. And so they actually make long files of 200 to 600 ants and raid termites at their foraging sites and bring the termites back to their nest where they are feasted upon. But before they start their raids, they actually send out scouts to look for the termites. And once they've spotted them, the scout ants have to return quickly to get everyone back there before the termites leave. On their way back, the scouts show something very unusual. They take the quickest route, which is not always the shortest. So for example, if there's really tall grass, they that'll slow them down. So they will actually take a detour on flat ground that will double their pace. So they found that on average, they were able to reduce their time back to the nest by 35% taking wow. the longer route. The really weird thing about this is that they are not sure yet how they're navigating. <laughs> 
And um, that's what they want to research next is what is the navigational abilities here? Because they're not relying on the same navigational aids that other ant species use in that they found in pr previous studies. The, the really crazy thing is that the decision on which way to take is made by individual ants. It's not a collective decision. So this is individual autonomous ants saying, I think that way is quicker. So this is the first proof of time optimized path integration by individuals in the ant kingdom. They got to get there faster. The faster the ant, the yes. better the colony. The, sh the shortest route is not always the fastest. So maybe don't always listen to your mm -hmm. GPS. Right. You might know of a little long cut that cuts <laughs> your time. And the ants do. They know Certainly in the Bay Area, I have quite a few long cuts. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm convinced some of those uh, GPS rerouting things are to get. We've talked about this. Other people out of. <laughs> out of the way. way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good. All right, everybody. Have we done it? I, I think, think we did. I think so. I think we did it. Oh, thank you so much for a great show. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you to Fada for helping us on our show notes and also in our social media. Thank you to Identity4 for recording the audio for the show and to Brandon for simulcasting the show to Facebook. Thank you, everyone in the chat rooms, all three of the chat rooms. Thank you for chatting. Those of you on YouTube, you weren't keeping it nice and clean tonight. Mm, not so happy. Let's clean that up over there, YouTube. And everyone else, though, you guys are rocking it. We love our chat I'm rooms. I'm only in Thank one you. chat room. There's three chat rooms. <laughs> like, this is getting too difficult. I you got to keep up. up. Keep up. <laughs> Wherever we are, we're there to chat. So those of you, we hope that this show inspired moments for you to chat for the rest of the week. And we hope that we will see you again next week. But before we go, I'd like to give shout outs to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Paul Disney, G. Burton Lattimore, Richard Onimus, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, uh, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Andy Grow, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Ed Dyer, Craig Landon, John Ratnaswamy, Mark Massaros, Jack, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K., Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Kyle Washington, Eric Knapp, Richard, Brian Condren, Noah Zemke, Jim Seabright, and Ashish Pants, Jacqueline Boyster, Ulysses Adkins, Sean Bryant, Sarah Chavez, Richard Porter, Artyom, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Slizuski, Jim Drapeau, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Ben Rothig, Steve Lessiman, Kirk Larson, Robert Aston, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie Gary S., Robert Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthan, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, E.O., Mark Tyrone Fong, and Keith Corsell. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And for those of you who are interested in helping us out over on Patreon, you can find information at twist.org. Click on that Patreon link or just visit patreon.com slash this week in science. You can also help twist out by telling your friends about twists. On next week's show, we will be back once again talking all about the science news from the, the week to come. We'll be back on Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Pacific time. You can watch live and join the chat at twist.org slash live. But, you know, if you can't make it, don't worry about it because everything is archived. That's right. You can go to twist.org slash YouTube, twist.org, or our Facebook page to find the show. Thank you for enjoying Twist, which is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile type device, you can look up Twist, the number four droid app in the Android marketplace. Or again, This Week in Science and anything Apple marketplace -y. For more information on anything you've heard here today or to watch that video of the tardigrade pooping, um, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts or other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBads at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in your 
subject line. Otherwise, your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything other than tardigrades make big turds, <laughs> remember. It's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just not understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from Jeopardy. Jeopardy! And this week in science is coming away. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods that are rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Because it's this week in science. Science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn any from the words that we said then please just remember it's all in your head because it's this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 this week in science this week in science 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 this week in science this week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. And that brings us to the end of our show. I do hope that uh, your garden is not uh, taken over by the uh, flatworm, the hammerhead flatworm. I'm so sorry. So sorry. <gasps> uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing now. Going to stop screen sharing now. I'm going to stop screen sharing now. Going to stop it now. I just realized my hair matches my backdrop. Ah! <laughs> I got some I got some pink color in there some and it's kind of it's got this 
red in the. Mm. I'm very tonally tonally matched, according to these lights. There's colors in there. There's some colors. Yeah. Oh my goodness. The comments over on YouTube. I know that the YouTube is still going, and you're over there. There are people over there. Are you being Ellsworth Danby Dansby? Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the episode and learned. I was making comments about the YouTube commenters because there were a lot of people over there today who had to have messages deleted and be hidden because they were making trouble. I have to say... Um, which is not cool. We're not down with that. I'm Go really ahead. proud of our Twist community and um, oh, the people who have our backs. I know that also in our um, web chat, in our like IRC chat, um, there have been people that have showed up and not understood what we're trying to do here or what kind of people we mm -hmm. are or how we want to talk. And um, everybody has our backs so quickly. And it's the internet can really be a... a crappy place to be if people don't have your back and it's pretty great <laughs> yeah i mean facebook we have great comments over on facebook we have great comments in our chat room our chat community is fantastic and i think that our youtube can um, many times our youtube chat can be great also i think it just takes one or two bad apples mm -hmm. um but if everybody bands together mm -hmm to not accept that behavior, then that is our community. And so um, over on YouTube, I'd I would love those of you who are watching, you know, to try and keep the troublemakers in line if we can um, as a community, because that's not what we stand for. We're here for the science. We're not here to comment on people's appearances. We're not here to comment on people's ethnicities. We're not here to comment on, um, you know, we're not that's not we're caught what we're what we're here to talk about we're not here for any kind of hate speech we are here to talk about science and uh to talk about the betterment of humanity really yeah <laughs> that's what i like there's the hope again <laughs> there's the hope i hope and i know that our community over on youtube too i mean it's i think youtube it's like people wander in sometimes and don't know what's going on but um, there's a place for all of us in the community to stand up and say, hey, yeah, you know what? Be cool. Be cool. Yeah. Just enjoy the show and you don't have to be rude. Okay? This is why we can't have yeah. nice things. We can have, yes, noodles. We can have unicorns. <laughs> we can, yes, noodles. Oh, I like that. Yes. CR1 in the small intestine of life be the good gut bacteria. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and a big group hug, loquacious one. That's right. Mm. I know, don't feed the trolls, but sometimes you do need to put the trolls in their place and tell them they need to be quiet and then uh, help to ban them. <laughs> yeah. this is, I, don't know I, I, you know, I don't have all the time and ability to do that while I'm hosting the show. So um, people who are able to do that, that's wonderful. Irons in the Fire, thank you for commenting over there on YouTube. I appreciate that. Uh, it looks like Justin had a power outage, which is interesting because he's still it's, online. It's actually, it's <laughs> oh, there you are. You're better. Nothing changed in my lighting. It's just my camera yeah. decides sometimes. It's, like oh, it's better now. Let, let's. You're done. Um, <laughs> it's dark. This, no, is M key over on Facebook. You're you're not alone in your chat. You're not alone. And thank you for uh, for uh, for joining us on Patreon. Go ahead, Justin. Uh, the whole I don't now I'm blurry. Before I was just like not lit. Now oh, I'm, I, now you're I, better. I, my camera. I'm gonna get a new camera one of these days. Just give your camera has, some time. I need a new camera too. My laptop camera is beam. So you guys, the but, camera I got is a Logitech. And it's um, it's amazing. It's this little tiny camera, and, and yeah, you're, you're crystal clear. You're it's a perfect. it's HD 1080p. It's beautiful. So I highly recommend this camera. Okay, I highly I'm recommend. For it in the mail. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh... is it Mac <laughs> compliant? Uh should be. All right. Yeah. So the the not feeding the trolls thing, uh, is something that. 
I got into pretty heavily a long time ago on Twist when mm-hmm. there was a the, it was we were getting trolled by creationists and there was this anti-evolutionary movement yeah. to put, you know stickers on textbooks that were disclaimers against evolution mm-hmm. um, disclaimer 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 you know and <laughs> i and i went i went pretty heavily after them directly and engaged in every conversation that was presented and eventually they went away um so i i have i i kind of agree and disagree with the whole don't feed the trolls thing uh i sometimes think if you if you can articulate uh the opposing view that the troll is clamoring on about uh, you yeah. inform the greater audience a little bit and yeah and it i agree i mean right yes but you have yeah. to have the 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 time and the emotional strength in that moment to deal with that because that's the other side right is that like yeah. when you first start that conversation you're going to get hit back hard and so you, if you power through sometimes you succeed and sometimes you know you can help uh, educate people around the conversation which is important but if you're not in an emotional or or physical state to be able to fire back responses to everything you get thrown at for the next, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm always two to 24 hours, 24 seven. I'm ready to go 24 seven. Bring it. I yeah. really like, yeah, I'm ready. Always. Oh, speaking of evolution, hot red says, oh. says my uh, camera is set to autofocus. It is. And, and I've gone through lengths and found a thing that could change it and set it. And then every time the dang old, computer does one of those updates it negates oh, every back. setting that i did to this camera and then i gotta go find and upload the controller wrap and then have it open in the window again and do all this it's just nonsense i just need a camera that doesn't rely on windows it's a microsoft camera so anything that microsoft changes on my computer the camera's like oh we're gonna start fresh with this dang autofocus right. and lighting we're gonna and do it all over uh speaking of evolution in Arizona, I believe it's Arizona. Um, the there is a new new language for science education and evolution mm-hmm. educa- education that's being voted on. It's open for public comment right now. Um, so if you're in Arizona, uh, if you're a voter in Arizona, I think you can comment mm-hmm. on it. But they have changed the language to remove the word yep. evolution. Yep, sure did. From the science curriculum. Mm -hmm. Super good idea, guys. And and the superintendent of the schools is has is has been caught on camera promoting intelligent design, saying that creationism should be taught as an alternative theory to evolution. God, it's been hundreds of years. Why are we still having this conversation? Why do we have to talk about this? And the courts have even said no. Intelligent design is not a suitable alternative. It is a tool for creationists to get religion into the schools. The courts, the federal courts have basically said this. And so now their new ploy is just to get rid of words Mm -hmm. that they don't like because that invites the conversation, invites the debate. If you don't have the word evolution, then what are you talking about? Yeah, unfortunately, the the next generation science standards have already been adapted in a couple states where they've done that. They've taken evolution and climate change out of the standards, which is crazy because I've read those standards front to back that are this thick many times now. Um, and every time, I don't understand how you can have it without it. They've in, They've intertwined it into mm-hmm. the curriculum progressively from K through yeah high school those things they they're concepts that build on each other and to and to say that it's not there like they talk about heritability and they talk about variation and they talk about mutation and all this kind of stuff from kindergarten it's it's ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous so so i being an ivory tower intellectual elitist (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) oh this is gonna be good yes Uh, uh, from your from your school, oh. strong, my high school dropout in this. 
<laughs> although, although technically, you didn't drop out. I proficiated at it. I took a test that said I wouldn't have to ever go back to high school again. And I went to college uh, a year earlier than I would have been able to, but then dropped out of that. And then went back to college and dropped out of that. And went back to college and dropped out of that. And went, this cycle of figuring out that um, brick and mortar schools are not for me. But the 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 thing that uh, the the ivory tower intellectual elitist thing, because I I'm like okay with it. I, I I have this this sense that we should allow people to pursue and pursue for their progeny and pursue for their community a a lifestyle and an intellectual and an awareness and ignorance. But that we should also then, at the same moment in which a community decides that they're going to change or remove evolution from their textbook, we should remove everything else that science has contributed to. to creation. <laughs> right? <laughs> just get, just get rid of it. Just, just get rid the, of just, it. The, just, just as soon as they pass that law, evolution will not be taught in school and boom, power grid goes down. <laughs> right? No more electricity for that community. Sorry. They are now off the grid. They're free to Amish it up all they like. And I can offend the Amish because they're not listening. They can mm -hmm. Amish it up all they like. And they can do their prepper society where they dig holes and live in them. And, you know, live off of earthworms or whatever their, their, their strategy. It's this, this there idea There are going to be any earthworms left. <laughs> we'll we'll remove the hospitals. We'll remove the electricity. We'll remove anything that science has created. They no longer have access to. Fine, absolutely fine with that. I know. Yeah, let's go back. Because this is what they want. They want. They want a. They want a a path to power uh, within the community that does not require facts or reality to back it up. They want unearned educationally unearned power in on this earth yeah uh without having to have <laughs> done the work or relied upon the work of others or work is well and this is the problem too is right that the new next generation science standards are all about the integrated approach and how science helps you be a functional human adult right so it's not about like can you recite the scientific method can you copy back the the periodic table of elements. It's about, hey, can you use uh, the scientific method to figure out if a thing works? And if it doesn't, can you fix it so that it works? Stuff like that, right? And so if you, if you then can't evaluate uniformly across, right? So this whole idea was like, oh, we'll have the next generation science standards. Everybody will have the same progression building on scientific knowledge alongside with math and literature and language arts standards and all this kind of stuff. But then the problem is now these states that have altered the standards have to come up with their own evaluations. So isn't that a fun uh, kind of catch 22 that now they get to evaluate themselves however they want yeah. <laughs> kind of defeats the whole purpose. <laughs> so <laughs> defeats the purpose anyway just let yeah. us teach science everyone everyone chill <laughs> let us teach science you don't tell the plumber how to fix the pipes don't tell the people whose entire career has been teaching science and how to teach science and how children learn and brain development and all this kind of stuff don't tell them how to do their job either yeah, this whole thing, it sounds as though there was a team. So there were new standards developed by a team of more than 30 educators. And then they were submitted to the Arizona Department of Education. And then according to some of the teachers that wrote the standards, the state normally edits for clarity and grammar. It makes changes to document formatting. But then the changes that were put in place were more than that and apparently they uh the woman who is responsible for it is superintendent diane douglas um and she has defended her uh her ideas and um 
And it says, the changes were enough to cause the Department of Education's Director of K-12 Science Education to resign. Oh, yikes. (laughs) Okay, so... I don't under I don't understand. I mean, you're the if if you're going to be if you're the director, aren't you above the superintendent? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't I, would, I don't like why I don't understand the resigning when yeah. I mean I mean I understand being upset, but then you just put your foot down and you say no. I don't know. It's very complicated. There's so much red tape in school systems. It's insane. Um. Yeah, it's it's weird to answer irons in the fire in the YouTube chat that I'm watching now, which is so fun. I can't do it during the show, but during the after yeah, show, I can. I know. Um, irons in the fire asks, where does this leave STEM programs? So STEM, science, technology, engineering and math is an acronym. It doesn't actually mean anything when it comes to education standards. It's more of a thing yeah. that you'd say uh, we offer STEM programs for school. So it's it's an acronym that you use to convey that your your program or your curriculum or whoever it is you're offering has those elements in it. Um, the thing that, that was the previous standards were state science standards. So here in California, we had the California science standards. So um, those were around for um, around 20 years, um, took about 10 years to make. The NGSS similarly has taken, it took almost 10 years to make and then get kind of disseminated. And then each state has a certain amount of years to adopt. And so in adoption, you are allowed to make adjustments like Kiki was talking about. But the original plan for that was for things like, oh, well, we'll change this conversation about drought to conversation about flooding because we're in Florida or um, we don't, you know, whatever reason, things, they weren't intending that there would be um, content edits based on, you know, disbelief in science. But as we've talked about on the show before, most science textbooks have a Texas edition and a California edition, and you can buy one of those too. And so the California edition is um, the one that has usually all the science in it. (laughs) And the Texas edition usually is the one that has some edits as some of the um, side-by-side conversations of intelligent design versus evolution. And they stage a debate in the classroom and this kind of stuff. So it's, we're we're getting better. The the fact that there's dissent about this process right now, I think is huge. So that, that is progress because, you know, in the last set of science standards that we had, I'm sure Arizona just, took the Texas version and went with it, you know? So I think that this, um, it's good news to me that there's a conversation being had, but I wish it was yeah. further along. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's an article from um, Arizona Public Radio that is uh, about this. They're saying um, that, so the Department of Education in Arizona made unexpected last minute changes shifting from big ideas to vocabulary words Mm -hmm. and watering down the concept of evolution. Um, It doesn't mention climate change, though, right? They didn't I'm not sure. The new Arizona science standards are meant to encourage a messy, hands-on approach to science. The Department of Education's revisions shifted the focus backwards. Quote, as a professional, as a science educator, I just could not support teaching students this incorrect idea of what science is, says Lacey Weiser, the department's former director of K-12 science education. She resigned rather than implement the changes made during an unprecedented internal review. She says, I think the changes really shift from the focus of this idea of science of discipline for helping students make sense of the world, the world to really just memorizing a body of facts. She was also alarmed by the addition of so-called key concepts to the standards. They look a lot like the old vocabulary terms emphasized in Arizona's outdated standards from 2004, which is what a committee of experts who wrote the new document wanted to get away from. Another troubling change, department staff deleted or qualified the word evolution throughout the document. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah, so this is for the next generation, uh, science 
standards, the Arizona still has not adopted it and is one of the 19, uh, no, is, uh, let's see. Yeah, Arizona hasn't adopted it yet and has chosen to write its own standards. And so schools in Arizona may not be able to use national resources. Great. Yeah, that's uh, that's another issue. It's a, it's a state really? saying, I want to have my state's rights. And it's like, you can. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't say anything about climate change, although it sounds, I mean, if they're... So I don't know. So back to my ivory intellectual elitist tower. I I've become strongly in favor of state rights recently. Yeah. I think Great. states state states' rights are very important, but I think in terms of um in terms of standardizing the basics of education that all students across the United States should be able to get. There's a place, you know, where that becomes a little tricky, where it's well, it, it's it, like, it yes, does. I get it. But right. then you have, you know, then you have Kentucky or Arizona or, you know, wherever not teaching climate change, not teaching evolution um, and kids like they're not learning. They're not learning what everyone else is learning. And that's a problem. Mm. It is. It is. And and the whole like you don't get federal dollars if you're blah, 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 blah. Like, you know. I don't know. Uh, again, ivory tower being in California, where we have a surplus yeah. of taxes going to, we're 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 in the uh, we're in the black in terms of <laughs> we're or I guess we contribute more to the federal than we take. States like Kentucky don't. That's a welfare state to begin with, and if they want to further cut themselves off from any federal dollars when it comes to education and everything else, again. There's this like sort of like trying to destroy the fabric of a of of an age of reason society that takes place in a lot of these states. I don't know what the instinct is that drives people towards what I do know what it is. It's the desire to have power over people without actually being intelligent, without actually having rational thought involved. I I really believe that there's a desire to have an uneducated populace. Uh, because they're easier to rule. They're they're more likely to vote for your uneducated point of view if they themselves are not educated. You know, th there's there's things when it comes to to California that as a state with state powers and our our state's environmental regulations, for instance, our regulations on to what the car industry the auto industry can and cannot have coming out of a tailpipe yeah uh, because we're such a large state we can impact the decisions of the automakers to to where they they could make two or three or four different types of emission controls on every vehicle depending on the state they're going to send that vehicle to but at the end of the day that becomes additional expense so it's easier to build to the highest standard uh, and California does that. They have high standards for 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 carbon emissions from vehicles and that sort of thing. And so we have an enormous influence. And if we were, we were stuck with relying on a national standard for anything, whatever, our education, our emissions, pollution that can come from a factory, the uh, minimum wage, any of that, it would be a much more disastrous situation. So, so in that in that bad decision, uh, the, what the heck is going on in the in, in the state of Kansas? You know, Tennessee, Tennessee removed sex education mm -hmm. almost entirely from its curriculum, and it also happens to be the state with the highest rate of teen pregnancy. <gasps> How did that happen? I wonder. Um, you know. Eventually, eventually, this this experiment of democracy is supposed to look back on what it's done, to look back on the results and go, you know what? Uh, in Kentucky, they they reduce taxes and reduce taxes and reduce taxes, and now the teachers 
uh, can't afford to teach the students and are in full revolt. And the state is in a deficit and it's a welfare state relying on federal dollars and it can't produce much. Like there's a point where we've done the experiment. Look at the results. And this whole democracy experiment thing continues. What if we put a billionaire with no experience and questionable ethics in charge of the country? What could possibly go wrong? And amazingly, as, as much as you know, we can say this, that, or the other, one of the wonderful things about the way our country is constructed is our economy is not based solely on who the president is. You know, it's not a doling out, the deciding mm -hmm. this industry gets this much, this industry will now get that much. It's capitalism. So industry and economies survive despite who's the president. Uh, a lot of the policies, because they're state regulated, they're state controlled, that, that we have state elections that are separate from the national elections, don't necessarily change it very much, regardless of who the president is or who the Supreme Court is, because we have Supreme Courts in states as well. So the way our powers are so massively separated that the city I live in versus the city that you live in can have a different set of regulations above what our states have uh, allows for a, a, a tremendous amount of self-rule. And, and when we see these horrible efforts to remove evolution, which I think is a form of child abuse, abuse to remove scientific education from the curriculum of children to limit their ability to advance and, and interact with, the, with reality. Um, we have to understand that that's a side effect or that we have to deal with or that's a, that's a symptom uh, that comes about uh, when we can allow ourselves also to have all the success that we have in the communities that aren't doing that. So there, it's, it's a wonderful, horrible thing about our country, but we're not stuck with any single philosophy and it allows for experimentation. And not all experimentation is good and some of it is negative and some of it is, is ideologically or religiously driven. And most of us will survive whatever the negative is because in large, we look at results and communities decide to go in directions based on this. So. Well, uh, also just to add on to that kind of a different thing is if, if you, if you don't want to see what happens with that and you instead want to fix this problem, <laughs> um, one place that you can go is to NCSE, um, the national center for science education. So NCSE.com. I go, I get their daily digest of all of the science standards uh, updates from the various states that are going through uh, adoption right now. And uh, there actually is a really good success story. I was trying to find it um, uh, in the, in the example of New Mexico. So New Mexico did exactly what Arizona is doing right now. They gutted the NGSS, they removed all of evolution and all of climate change mentions. Um, and they were trying to push through this mess, right? Um, but as soon as NCSE found out what was going on, they, they did um, a whole blitz with the press. They talked to the press. They, they engaged people in New Mexico. Um, a lot of the people living in New Mexico who would actually be affected by this, who have children in the school system, they, a lot of them actually did act. And there was a huge um, demonstration or, of criticism on the public education department when they were going to adopt their messed up version of the standards. And um, then towards the end of that month, a whole almost an entire month later, they pushed it back, pushed it back, pushed it back and decided in the end to adopt the entire NGSS in its entirety unedited. Um, so this is a situation where in this exact same kind of status where they're, they're talking a big game, they, they've, they, they're putting forward these, um, these gutted uh, standards. It's not going to work in every single state, but part of being abreast of these things and being aware and telling your friends who live there and, and sharing things on social media or whatever it is you're going to do, but part of being aware of the, of the fight, actually, it, it starts to show you that in a lot of these states, 
there are huge communities of people who want the proper standards. And if there's a large enough majority of that, then they can make their voices heard and demonstrate and tell their Congress people and tell their superintendent and their Department of Education and changes can be made before it's too late. So it's pretty cool. I would encourage yeah. for anyone yeah, who's very NCSE. interested in this topic, yeah, to sign up for NCSE's blog. Um, and they're actually all of their staff are really great blog writers. They're they're, they're fantastic. They're, they're I know so them. Good. They're great people. Yeah, they're so entertaining and kind of quirky, and their narrative is excellent. But they also tell you exactly as much for me as I would want to know about a thing, which is a lot but not too much. <laughs> yeah. We've had, we've interviewed them from time to time yeah. on the show, which has been, which has been good. Yeah. yeah. But they do it's great so work. Funny. Funny like, work. Yeah. Work. But it's just so funny. Every once in a while you think, Oh, climate change is a thing now. Nobody's talking about evolution anymore. And then something pops up like this and you're like, what? It's Seriously? impossible for me to tell as a, as an educator, you know, sometimes I'll go to a school and they'll say, you can't say evolution here. And then I'll just talk about, adaptation a whole bunch and about how certain Maybe aspects of animals are they, good for certain things. Yeah, yeah, I'll go to schools. It's happening less and less, but I'll go to schools where they say you can't use the E word. Um, and I will occasionally go to other schools where they say that you can't talk about climate change. And then I'll say, okay, well, you definitely shouldn't pick our climate change lesson then. Um, but it's not often both. And it's very hard for me, per, for me to these predict which one it's going to be. I mean, you're in the you're in the Bay Area. I mean, these aren't You'd public be surprised. schools. Are oh they? no, they're they're not public oh, schools. No, 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 no. They're, no, no. Private, they're schools. private schools. But right. but you would be surprised that it does still happen. Um, that I go to places and they tell me that I cannot talk about those things. And the problem oh, is, no. I'm I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna go there because my visit could still be some of the only real science that those students get for the year. <laughs> so. I am not going to deprive the children of seeing the animals and hearing their stories um, because I'm not allowed to use a certain word. I do usually talk about evolution anyway, but I don't use the word and I have never gotten in trouble for it. Just use so, other words. The teachers at those places aren't specialized enough to be smart yeah. enough to catch you. Yeah, UC, absolutely. <laughs> UC Davis uh, has a has a sort of primer for visiting instructors in life sciences that that warns them and informs them about ha has to sort of educate them about the fact that they will have certain students that don't believe in evolution Wow! because yeah. uh, it's not a thing in most countries you go into a science oriented classroom yeah. and talk about evolution and people go well oh, it's just a thing that doesn't yeah. happen other places it's yeah. sort of like yeah. how how when they did that poll and global warming was only like a controversial or a conspiratorial subject matter in the united states it's we have uh that's what we're talking about yeah, yeah we have we, we have an interesting mix yeah it's here. you gotta roll with your punches do what you can spread the science where you can that's what we're doing oh, with the punches. Spread nice. all the science. No. Yeah. <laughs> how did you do, don't use did... the E word when they tell you you can't? <laughs> how did Kenny God. Rogers get involved in this? I'm not. <laughs> no, I was I'm there too. I was. It. I was I actually thinking exactly that it. when you started singing. Mm -hmm. I was like. <gasps> We were thinking the same thing. Yeah, that would be a fun song. I didn't backhand teachers. I was backhanding. Yeah, I did backhand some yeah. teachers. I did. Yeah. I'm sorry for that. No. Exactly. I'm sorry for that. I I love teachers. I just get upset. I get upset about those kinds of things. And yeah. myself... Personally, I am the type of person that when somebody tells me or I know I'm not supposed to talk about something, the first thing that comes out of my mouth <laughs> is that thing. <laughs> oh gosh, that's great. So, so here's visiting, what... visiting France, talking to the French people who took us out to dinner so nicely. Well, you know, California wine. So much better. So, so good. So much better. Yeah. So, oh, okay. so, yeah. so let's was, talk about Catholicism. This was uh, <laughs> this was little Justin. 
in the 10th grade, somebody from the Nancy Reagan's Just Say No program uh, was doing a speech in like second period class. And they started off, there are 354 different chemicals in marijuana. Hand goes up in the back of the room. Mine. Yes? How many of those are harmful? Well, uh, there's a number of different compounds. Hand goes up in the back of the room. Yes? How many chemicals, separate compounds are there in a breakfast cereal? Well, that's a, there's, you can differentiate between... <laughs> how, many, how many people have overdosed or died from, from marijuana ever in the history of ever? This is you at ever. 10 years old. No, no, this is not t- not ten years old, tenth grade. So oh, what is that? Grade, okay. or something. Yeah. Right. But it was, but like there is there is a thing that you know, I've never been afraid to say that thing you're saying is constructed only in such a way to get across a message, and it's re- relieving everybody of the facts in doing so, right? Like. I, like I, the, I, I did this. I, this is only a couple years later at the community first community college that I dropped out of high school to go to. There was in the town square in Arcata, California. There was uh, around Christmas. There was a group of um, what do you call it? like uh, they're, they're ringing the bell. I guess they're fundraising, but they're also preaching um, some sort of Christian faith sermony thing, and. And they're talking against evolution and all these sort of things. So I decided I would stand on the opposite side of the street and start talking about dinosaurs, start nice. talking about evolution. Start talk- and I was doing, th- and actually I got a bigger crowd. And, and I like, <laughs> I was also like a 17 year old, 16, 17 year old kid without all my, you know, without a depth of knowledge really of science, but I got other people involved in the activity who were then talking who who were like at you know had been at the university were maybe anthropologists or you know life sciences people who started then saying out loud things that they knew about evolution it turned into this fast fantastic like thing that just happened right there on the spot where you had people talking about science on one side of the street and people who were like trying to discount science as it turned out first they were just saying the things about the creation and like you know this was that and that happened to then and then people lived for 400 years until there was a flood and then people only lived to be 80 ish um but i i think that that that's what if anything we could teach people is to call bs when they see it mm-hmm. is, to, is to say you know that the insight of the thing that you're telling me while I can see an element of truth to it, perhaps, the reason that you're telling it to this particular audience is because you want to convey this message specifically. And I feel like you're overriding a lot of facts that happen between the thing that you started, the, 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 the thing that you want them to know, and the way that you're presenting your information. I can tell you're leaving out this, that, and the other. <coughs> and I think we need more of that. I think we need more people to be. And I don't even think it's necessarily a critical thinking thing, although that's part of it. But it's a skeptical thing, but it's not just being skeptical because that can be, you can apply that to everything. You can be like, I'm skeptical about science. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Like, you can be. Well, totally that's like a skeptical. misuse of the word, also. It is, it is yeah. but, but skepticality, it's the, the limiting factor of being a skeptic is you, you're always skeptical about things you don't know. And so it's it's the the you know a a physicist being skeptical and me at seventeen being skeptical are completely different things. Or even me now when it comes to anything physics, that's just like being a skeptic is great, except it's based on your level of education. So you can be a terrible skeptic if you're not very well educated, but or you can be very skeptical all the time because you don't know any better. So skepticism. Is well, I think I think again that's like a, a colloquialized version of the word that people don't know. Again, it's what they don't know, right? Mm-hmm. But being a skeptic is about like wanting more information or wanting to see the um 
the process of, you know, the line of reasoning, the explanatory chain. Um, but people use it to say, you know, I don't believe that. Right. I'm skeptical. Yeah. But that's, it's not what it's meant. Right to be for is like show me the process show me the a to z i want to see it as opposed well, no, to actually no that's not true yeah but here's the other thing i would say to that though. i mean this this part of this is this as well it's like well, if you're interested in that why don't you go look for that information i don't need to show it to you, mm -hmm. why don't you that's go also true. the burden of proof the, that mm -hmm. whole conversation right yeah. libraries google all of the things yeah that's like the person who who has no um, argument of their own other than a statement, right? And then when you contradict that statement, you now have to explain why you're right. All right. That's the whole burden, of, the fallacy of the burden of, tr of, of proof, that's right? True. It's like, yeah. that's not how, and that's, that's what happens to me on the internet all the time, which is when I'm like, all right, I'm done. Because I don't, I don't have to go and do an hour of homework to find out what I know to be true because I've done this hour of homework before because you told me I have to do that. If you don't want to believe me and you don't want to look it up for yourself, bye-bye. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you later. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But, but Speaking this of is, which, this is also, I need oh, I do need to get going. Okay. Yeah. This is a fan, this is a great conversation and I am enjoying it, but I have to get going. Marshall is you can go, I want to. I want to leave with a parting, a parting, parting thought. Yeah, parting shot um, off the bow. Parting shot, which is one of the one of the things I learned in the uh, the ideology wars, I guess, or the creationist trolling conversations, is that people who tend to have ignored all of science because they haven't re done the reading, they haven't done the research and all of that, also tend to not to have delved into or read or researched their own point of view. It's not like they came with their separate body of knowledge. Exactly, And I found, yeah. I found amazingly that creationists, religious ideologues, don't know the Bible. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like, like this yeah, is yeah. like that's the other side of that argument. It's like some of them I, do, but some of them uh, don't. You know, it just yeah. like most of the people who I've encountered and interacted with and had these conversations with, and I've only done like two or three read throughs, like beginning to end of the, of this this work. Uh, don't actually know what their document, the, the the thing that they're convinced of, they haven't read or researched, and that's. And that's the thing, is, is relying on an assumption of what the thing that you think is true is based on without ever even having looked into that. Like, go look into that first. I, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that could convince more people of evolution than anything else is compare is, is is actually have them go read their text go have them read their document ask them to read their documents that are in refute that are refuting uh what mm -hmm. says. read and the document not just it's not even so much that they need this. to be exposed to science i think they need to be exposed to their own ideological underpinnings because they have not, haven't even had that. They haven't explored it. And that's the problem. People who don't explore. Good night. Exploration. It's just, it's, uh, yeah, they need to explore it all. Yeah. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good, good night, night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, you guys. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us once again. We'll be back. Another week in the can. Um, yeah, we'll be back next week. No special news before we go. So I hope that we see you all later. Thank you so much. We love you. Goodbye. We love you. Goodbye. Oh, those of you who are Patreon sponsors, I have reached out related to MP3 stuff and T-shirt sizes and other things. So we're in the process. But um, 
If you have not seen those messages, check your email for the Patreon messages I sent if you should be getting one. Um, yes, check your messages. I'll see you later. Okay, and uh, Justin, hang on the line one second, and we'll chat with you. Oh, how about things that I'm supposed to do? Oh, yeah, no, okay. I accidentally hit the button, and now I'm also not here. <laughs> what a punk. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm gonna hit the stop broadcast button. Good night, everybody.